What is up, everyone? Happy Friday and welcome to The WAN Show. It's going to be a very exciting show for you guys today. We've got, of course, the big controversy this week. Why is it that YouTubers keep killing perfectly innocent companies? How could they? What did those companies ever do to these YouTubers? They're so cruel and awful. We've also got an extremely special guest this week, the one and only Jim Keller. I'll give you guys a bit of a longer introduction right after the intro. Now Luke gets... I mean, I'm sure there's something else that's going to excite the people. Uh, <laughs> He's trying. I don't know, man. I the did, Spiffing Brits PC needed repairs? Oh, you went right what did, for... What did you do? What did what did my heart do to you? I, I, Why did you feel the need to jab something into it and twist? Build, and, a, build a questionable did I, computer. Did I destroy I your company? You <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. Uh, and Boston Dynamics has a crazy new robot. And of course, of course, in Boston Dynamics style, they had to it's release a horse. an absolutely psychotic video about oh, it. Oh, you're going to say, of course, of course, and it's not going to be a horse? I, I missed the video, so I didn't know what it was. I assume, I mean, they have a dog. Uh, it's not a horse. I just assumed it's it more would... like humanoid. I'm 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 messing with you. I know. I know. What, I know I'm what clarifying it looks like. for the audience. They need to know things. <laughs> I do well did. They can still hear us. Yeah, I know, but barely. It's there's music. <laughs> The show is brought to you today by MSI, Squarespace, and Vessi. I'm going to spare him having to turn red while we talk about his illustrious career. But of course, our guest this week is the one and only Jim Keller, current CEO of Tense Torrent, co-founder of Atomic Semi, whose notable work includes, and brace yourselves because this is a bit of a list. He was the lead architect of the AMD K8 microarchitecture and co-designed the x86-64 instruction set. He was later the lead designer on the Zen architecture that catapulted AMD back to relevance and now more than. He helped design the Apple A4 and A5, the company's first in-house SOC. He's the former VP of Autopilot Hardware Engineering at Tesla more recently. He left Intel in 2020 uh, following a dispute. Well, we don't need to get into the exact details of that, but joined Tense Torrent as CTO the same year and became CEO in January of 2023. In 2023, he also co-founded Founded Atomic Semi, a foundry that's focused on designing and manufacturing low-cost fabrication equipment, which is something I have to admit had flown under my radar, and I'm definitely going to want to ask a little bit more about. And without further ado, thank you for coming on the show. There he is. Hey, thank you so much, and welcome. I'm, I'm, <clears throat> I'm struggling to impede, impede and smash your, your enthusiasm. <laughs> Pretty good. I think we all do. It's okay. Yeah, realistically, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> look, I usually have to sell it a little, but I am genuinely extremely excited to have you on the show. Uh, they asked me when I got on the phone with your team because we reached out when we saw the, the dev kit that you guys have right now. So this is on the Tense Torrent side. Um, and I was like, okay, obviously, whatever Jim's working on is probably cool as shit. So... No. Maybe there's something here, and so I scheduled a call. To, it's just an exploratory call, and they go, "Oh, well, you know, do you want to talk to Jim?" And I'm like, "Well, we don't really take guests on our show anymore, but um, yes, we'll make an exception. <laughs> yeah. That would be great." Wow. I don't want to waste anyone's time, which is actually a big part of the reason we don't take guests. We are notorious for starting our show anywhere from one to three hours late, and. Um, uh -huh. <laughs> We hate doing that to important people. So without further ado, I want to get into some of the community submitted questions. We announced that you were going to be joining us sure. and it would have been a huge disappointment if you weren't here, but you are. So Dylan asks, hey, Jim, I'm a junior computer engineering student about to start my first internship doing verification engineering at a big chimp company. First of all, did I just say chimp company? Anywho, doesn't matter. The point is, congratulations, Dylan. He says, it's great to see how far open source has gone. Uh, we even learn Risk Five in our introductory hardware course. Oh, cool! So, first of all, I want to I want to start with letting you talk about Risk Five a little bit because that's obviously a hugely important part of what Tense Torrent is doing right now. And I guess I realized I didn't really talk about Tense Torrent at all. So, do you want to give us a short introduction to what exactly drew you to this company and to their mission? 
Wow, okay, so Tensorrent is an AI computer design company. We're designing a high-end AI engine and also a high-end RISC-V processor. And I think, yeah, a AI has gone through a lot of evolution. And, you know, it started running on CPUs and then GPUs, and then I think Google announced the Tensor processor in 2015. And we're building essentially an array of Tensor processors that's programmable with open source. Uh, software stock that we released in January. And then there's going to be a combination of AI computing and, and general purpose computing tied together. And we decided to make a high-end RISC-V processor. Our AI processor also uses little RISC-V cores, you know, to drive the execution of the big tensor processor. So... And yeah, so the, and the RISC-V thing is really interesting because, you know, at some level, computer architectures are generic. It doesn't really matter very much if it's x86, PowerPC, MIPS, Alpha, ARM, or RISC-5, but only RISC-5 is open. And the Berkeley guys that started it were pretty good. And the cool thing about open source, you know, as we saw with Linux is, when it's open source, a whole bunch of people can work on it. It's a, it's a much better innovation platform. And there's a, it's a one-way door. When people go from you know proprietary technology to open source, they literally never go back. Linux killed literally all the proprietary Unix operating systems. And I think solely RISC-V is going to take over the computing world, which is pretty fun. Just and want to say- To your student if, friends, go, go ahead. I was just gonna say, if I'm one of those Berkeley guys, I'm putting, uh, Jim Keller said I'm pretty good on my LinkedIn. <laughs> <laughs> Like immediately. <laughs> That's yeah, awesome. they're pretty good. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I could tell funny stories about like, you know, computer science in universities and computer science and high end computer design companies, they, they kind of work together. And it's really interesting because a team of 100 people who work together for five years can refine that crap out of somebody, something. Whereas students, you know, they get a project and sometimes without that much support. And some of those projects are pretty good, and some of them, it's hard for it to add up to a lot, let's say. So uh, you've- But like, like the branch predictors everybody uses came out of universities, and the RISC-V architecture, which is gonna, let's say, dominate computing in 10 years, 10 years. Is, came out of universities, and now there's 20 odd companies building RISC-V computers and way more using it, so. Whether yeah, you did it on purpose, phenomenon. Uh, or whether you did it by accident, you actually transitioned me perfectly into the second half of Dylan's question. And uh, this is really cool, because okay. he asked for getting into a higher level architect slash designer position. If you want to work on one of those teams, are you going to recommend mm -hmm. stay in school, go for the PhD, or do you want years in industry? What are you looking for? I, well, so PhDs are really good for some people if you really have a research topic and you really want to go think really hard. But if you want, like, I didn't study computer design in college. I'm, I'm an electrical engineer. You know, my, my major is first electromagnetic fields. And then when I, my, my advisor ran the, the semiconductor physics lab. So I learned about, a lot about that. And then I took one logic design course and then got a job doing that. And then I got a d job at digital where I worked for a great architect Bob Stewart, and then computer architects, good ones, know about a lot of different things. So I learned how to program, you know, do a lot to design. I know about semiconductor physics. I, I know a weird amount about packaging and, you know, signal integrity and all kind of stuff. And so if you want to be a computer architect, you should probably work on a lot of different things. And most computer architects that are really good at it didn't do it in college, uh, you know, as a PhD. But interestingly enough, I, it's, it's almost like a too narrow of a way to go about it. PhD guys tend to be experts in something. And that makes computer sense. Computer architects tend to be tend to be generalists. I'd say. Yeah. So you already kind of alluded to this one as well, but William asks, I mean, you've obviously got experience on the ARM side. You've got experience on the x86 side. You've got experience on the RISC-V side. Um, William asks, how far do you think x86-64 can go? I mean, you're telling me now, you're saying, look, 
Risk five is going to be the future. You gave that number 10 years. I'm not going to hold you to it. I mean, I can't promise nobody else will, but I'm not going to hold you to it. Um, is that because x86 is out of gas or is it because risk five has just got some kind of fuel that we're only just discovering the potential for in the engine? Which, which one is it? Neither. So computers generically, you know, they fetch instructions, decode them and issue them. Right. And the thing that makes the front end of a computer fast is how many instructions can you decode? And how well can you predict the instruction stream? Right. So x86 has a deficit in the sense that, you know, random length instructions are harder to predict, but we sort of figured that out. It's just harder to do, but it's not like a big limitation. And then the execution engine goes fast because you have lots of parallel execution units and out of order issue, which is generic to computers. And then you have a good memory system with a really good predictor for where the data is coming from, which has nothing to do with the architecture. So I'd say x86 has a limitation. So it's 16 registers, variable length instruction set, and it sort of has a pile of old crud that nobody actually needs, but you have to build. So, so it has a tax. Right. But computer performance is mostly today based on prediction. And the number of predictors in a modern computer is crazy. We predict, obviously, like where the instruction stream's coming from, where the next branch is, the direction of the branch, call return stack. We predict the width and grouping of instructions. We sometimes predict the results of instructions. So we tell me this. Where the data's oh. coming from. So it's all prediction. Uh, one of the, uh, a follow-up question from William is, you know, could we see cores using multiple architectures? Could you see someone like an Intel or an AMD, an x86 license holder, taking uh, uh, some kind of RISC-V architecture, AI processor, coprocessor, and using that for prediction? Like an AI uh, accelerant maybe. on a traditional, does it just not make any sense? I mean, tell me. If it's a dumb question, I'd love to know. Yeah, it probably doesn't make very much sense. So, Computers are very optimized around, a, you know, a particular instruction set. Today, there's pretty good binary translators and they keep getting better. And binary translation from like an ARM instruction set to RISC-5 is relatively easy and back and forth. So you'll probably pick your general purpose computing architecture and then either recompile all the code or translate the code you need. Like Apple switched from x86 architecture to ARM architecture they hardly missed the beat. Nobody even noticed or cared. And that's some great. Of that's the Apple ecosystem and software build. But they could switch to RISC V and nobody would notice or care either. This is hilarious. Uh, he keeps beating me to what my next thing is going to be. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it's all prediction, right? So I just don't hey, even. Why prediction. do I even? Why do I bother talking? Well, um, we live in a simulation, and a good simulator predicts everything. And so. so the next thing well, I was going to. Wait, this. <laughs> the next thing from William's question that I was going to focus on. So, okay. so he asked, okay, how far will x86 go? Do you think Armor Risk V will replace it in the future? Uh, maybe we'll see using multiple architectures. So that's all William's question so far. I'm not taking any credit for that or blame. But what I will take credit or blame for is this next one. I was really focused on the word replace in his question. And you brought up mm -hmm. needing to recompile code. And software is something that I feel like is a a bit of an elephant in the room, you know, when you talk about how well, you know, fu fundamentally all processors are the same, essentially, it's like how many instructions can you process, but while Rosetta 2 was an absolute marvel um, to the point where just a few years ago, I wouldn't have even shortlisted William's question, let alone asked it to you. Mm -hmm. uh, but now that I've seen what Apple was able to do with that x86 to ARM transition, um, and what Qualcomm is claiming that they're doing on their upcoming Snapdragon chips with Windows on ARM, um, I feel like anything's possible. And that word, that replace word, can I expect to go back with, with, to legacy programs, right? Um, to, to stuff that, that is that, uh, that tax on x86, that tax mm -hmm. on Windows. And whether it's, through, uh, whether it's through AI or whether it's through on-the-fly recompiling, can I expect to replace the gaming PC that I have today with something RISC-V that will run, and I'm not going to ask for 100%, but if I asked for 90% of the software I used to run, do you foresee that? Yeah. Of course. Of course. So, 
more and more, more and more software is written in more in higher level languages, like recompiling C programs in Java and Python and you name it. It's getting easier and easier. Like the architecture mostly doesn't matter. Now, what matters is on a given architecture. Like we found this, we started building like a server stack for RISC V, and when they went from Intel to AMD to ARM to RISC V, each time you port software, it gets easier to do. And the hardest port, by the way, was Intel to AMD, even though they're both x86, right? Really? And that's because there's a whole bunch of proprietary, proprietary software stuff. in the server stack that was actually Intel proprietary. So you weren't, which, by the way, they weren't giving out the port. So they had to rewrite a bunch of stuff, but all the new software is in C, C++, it's clean. So porting the ARM was easier, right? Porting the RISC-V is pretty easy. Um, the thing you find is like the tool chain maturity, like somebody built a binary with some set of switches and then you link that and somebody mislabeled one of the header files and then you have to be an expert to figure out why this thing didn't work. But the actual porting of the software is not the, not the hard part. And, Can I interject and risk five ecosystem uses GCC and LLVM, and they're really mature compilers. Like they literally use the same compilers on the back end for all the architectures. You mentioned there the server yeah, stack for Risk Five. Um, that's a huge deal, and I know there was there was the struggles with the Intel to AMD transition, and that hampered AMD a bunch of stuff. It, it's going to be a big problem solving the the server stack thing. How is that going? I know you guys are working on it. I know some other companies are yeah, working pretty, on it. Yeah, it's going pretty good. So. And again, this is one of those. So, so Amazon did a really fun thing. So in AWS, they put Graviton in there. Yep. And first they, they ported some of their own applications. So and Amazon's pretty good at putting a gun to somebody's head and saying, you will go you know, port the software and get it running. And then they said, <laughs> yes, sir. And, and they did. You know, and, but then they put it up on the web and said, hey, if you want to you know, port your stuff to ARM, it's 30% cheaper, whatever the number was. And a lot of people said, sure, that's easy. It's JavaScript anyway, who cares, right? And so people started porting it, and the more people ported, the better it got. And it's easy to tell if the application, and they made it pretty generic. So I think what you'll see is like heterogeneous data system. So, you'll, so you have a cloud, and there'll be some Intel servers for the dinosaur code, and then there'll be ARM and RISC-V for stuff that's already been ported. And there'll be a price difference. And then people will go, you know, where they need to. So yeah, keep, keep converting. Like nobody cares about IBM 360 code or VAX code or Sun code or, you know, HPUX code. Like it's it's all gone. And, and and you won't care about the games that you ran 10 years ago because there'll be better games, they'll just emulate them or they'll AI emulate them. Like that'll be the really funny thing. You'll say, hey, I want to go play Super Mario Brothers. And you'll talk to a computer and, and describe Super Mario Brothers and and play a little video of, 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 you know, YouTube video from the 80s, you know, that played Super Mario Brothers, and it'll emulate the whole thing, and, and you'll think it's fine. That's kind of terrifying. Uh, I can tell there's you there's, no a, there's a lot of gamers watching this right now that are going to be really unhappy about that, but we're going to move on. We're going to move on, No, guys. some of them could be really happy because now they have these games that are going to get pawned from this, you know, the 80s and shit, and they'll be able to, like, train an AI engine to play perfectly. Nintendo's and litigating really already. Like Space Invaders, all the stuff that we used to play at bars. I can, I can hear Nintendo's like, lawyers from company. here. Yeah. yeah. Um, Carol asks, as a junior IC design engineer, I often wonder how to stay on the bleeding edge in the semiconductor industry. Recently, I discovered Intel PowerVIA entirely accidentally through a YouTube video and blamed myself for missing it for almost a year. What is your advice for keeping up with the industry besides just, I don't know, creating new technology yourself? Make sure you work someplace where they're doing new stuff. Wow. Oh. Okay. So, so, so what so happens? This is a recruitment interview. A lot of now. places. Yeah, we are hiring. Well, <laughs> sure, we are hiring. <laughs> no, so you build a technology like a CPU, and you know at first it's new, and you know it's got a lot of problems, and then you start refining. They get pretty good at it, and then the the management teams typically go, well, it's really risky and expensive to do a new one. What if it's worse, right? And you start refining, and what happens is people get in smaller and smaller boxes. Whereas when you do new, new, new projects with like a new team, everybody does a little bit of everything. 
and you have to go solve new challenges. And when you do a new project, you never use an old CAD tool or, you know, you, you sort of aim forward. Whereas I was at Tesla and we talked to vendors of a bunch of our chips and half of them couldn't do a small tweak to the chips they had in production. They've been shipping them for a couple of years. Well, was it the knowledge and that was they missing? They didn't have the CAD tools. No, they had the database to run it on the fab, but but they couldn't update it, right? And it was mm. so. So if you're a young engineer, make sure you're working someplace where they're doing new stuff. And there's okay. Lots of new stuff going on. You did it again. Um, you led me right into my next okay. question. Uh, this one's from me. So again, I get full credit or blame if it's a stupid question. Um, <laughs> I've always wondered this uh, in my layperson brain, you know, looks at a new innovation, uh, you know, a new a new generation of of chip, whether it's from an Intel and NVIDIA, um, a tense torrent, whoever. Right. And I look at it and I go, mm -hmm. OK, but really tell me this, this this idea you guys implemented. Where did it come from? You know, how much of that generational improvement is a we didn't think of it before versus B, we needed to try it first, but we went small before committing big, versus mm -hmm. we totally thought of it, uh, we totally knew it was a good idea, but the process node technology, for example, didn't allow it, we had other priorities. Like, how much of it is A, B, or C? I, wa I wanna know, right? Like 3D Vcache, it, I think is an- It's all of them. Yeah, okay. It's, it's, it's really weird, so, I mean, in the platonic reality, everything already exists, right? So we, we don't actually live in that world. There's <laughs> literally an infinite number of possibilities. Most of them are bad, right? And so... <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Strange. No, it's, it's true. It's a, yeah. <laughs> like, so, so that's a problem. Um, so there's one thing, which is you work out a bunch of, you know, architect you're making a new CPU. You have a bunch of ideas. You say, these are really solid but I want to make it say wider issue, but that causes you to have to go rebuild the entire cache and fetch system. And then the, the more instructions you fetch, the better your predictors have to be. And some predictors scale just by making them bigger, but sometimes you need a better algorithm. Like the simple branch predictors we started with were fine for years. But if you're trying to keep 500 instructions in a reorder buffer and never flush the pipe, it has to be so accurate, it's unbelievable. Now, some of those things were invented. Now, here's a funny story, which is Intel ran a competition for the best branch predictor. They published the results, and the one of them was in Wikipedia. And when we first started doing Zen, we needed a really good branch predictor. So I looked it up in Wikipedia, I flew over to meet the guy, and paid him for a patent. <laughs> you can't make this shit up. Now, the mathematical... So it turns out there's math That's under these sick. kinds of predictors, which is a little related to how neural networks and AI work, right? And so the initial predictors was sort of do what you did last time, and then the, the better version was keep more track of the history of what you did before right. and use that. But at some point, it started to look more like a computation of, you know, there's this space of paths in the program, and can you map, compress that space of paths to something useful and then predict which path you should follow on, which is related to a field of mathematics. And, and then it wasn't really possible until you had enough transistors. So Moore's Law gives you more transistors every couple of years. And so there's this little, and then there's a trade-off, like in the short run, maybe I'll make this bigger because it's easy but I can't just make, keep making it bigger, so I need to find a better idea or do something sophisticated and then take advantage of all the transistors. Like, it's, it's a combination of things. And then every time you build a computer, you'll learn a lot about doing it. You continue the performance model, software continues to evolve. And there's some things that used to be a bad idea that are not a good idea and vice versa. So it's, you know, it's, it's complicated. Let's shift our focus. And there's lots of published stuff, you know, like, like people don't realize how much information is out there. There's a hundred thousand people building faster computers. Let's and shift our some focus. People know a lot about what's going on. Yeah, go ahead, to AI, because um, obviously mm -hmm. that's that's your next big challenge that you're you're taking on right now. Um, mm -hmm. And it's 
I've got actually a number of different. Uh, you know what? I'll go with I'll go with one of the ones from our audience. Um, I've got a kind of an adder to this one. Charles asks, AI is set to disrupt the global economy in ways that we've never experienced before. Uh, not in our lifetimes, maybe never ever as a species. Uh, what do you see as your role? in guiding an economic future that includes AI. And then my follow on here is as a key contributor potentially to this upcoming change, do you feel a personal responsibility for shepherding AI in a responsible direction? Or do you kind of go, well, look, that's the software guy's problem. I just build, I just build the, the platform that it rides on. Like wh what's going on here in your mind? Well, if you're an historian, you know, the human race has been radically disrupted, you know, a dozen times in the last couple hundred years. You know, automation is kind of wild. Uh, my father used to tell me it was the fractional horsepower motor that automated all the factories. You know, electricity generation was huge. Obviously, you know, everybody talks about the printing press, books, being able to read, college educations, highway system. It's It's... It's a lot, right? And then Kurzweil says, except, you know, progress accelerates. And so it's one thing for something to happen like once a generation, but we've gone through mainframe, mini computer, workstation, PC, mobile, internet. Internet, yeah. You know, cloud computing, you know, always on, always connected. And a lot of that's in my AI. lifetime, man. Like, yeah, what yeah. is going so this on? Is, this is a lot of accelerations in one place, right? Now, I'm a technologist. I know how to build computers. And we, like, my part of it is I, I really don't think the world would be a good place if only the, the super rich corporations had big computers. Right? I think AI technology should be available to as many people as possible, that the software should be as open as possible. I really. I really like the fact that some people are publishing really good AI models. We decided to publish our compiler stack. As you know, like the core of the TPU compiler and NVIDIA stuff is proprietary and not accessible to, to everybody. Um, in terms of managing society, I, I don't believe individuals are the right answer to that. I think this is a collective effort, which needs a lot of people to think about it. Also, but on the flip side, in most of the transitions we've ever had, the doomsayers have been wrong. Right? We keep solving the, you know, how does society and people and individuals work together to solve our technology problems and the balance of power between all the factions. You know, so I, you know, I have some concern about it. I have a belief in human progress. I think. I, I, I like the open source world. I like open technology. I like products that people can build and afford. I'm not really into the one trillion dollar computers that only two people can afford. You know, so my tends towards mission is partly I like how do we make computers cheaper and how do we make them more open? And <clears throat> when we're licensing our technology to a bunch of people to build their own products. And you know, I think that's that's part of the democratization I'd say of of AI and software in general, which, which I'm a fan of. So. so tell me this. I mean, AI is clearly, it's in, that, it's in that stage right now. It's like it's like it's a toddler, right? Like it'll do something one day that impresses the hell out of you. And then it'll be, you know, running to greet you when you come home. And it'll trip and nail its face on the floor. And it's got a big nosebleed, you know, the... the five minutes later, right? Like it's, it's clearly stumbling around looking for its footing, but you see the potential, right? You see what this thing's going to grow up into. How harmful do you feel like high visibility AI fails are? Um, the humane pin, for example, is something that we're going to be talking about later on in the show as generated a ton of mainstream buzz. And I mean, that's, that's obviously, there's some recency bias there that makes me bring up that versus, uh, you know, talking about some of the, um, okay, like the $30 million heist that was facilitated by uh, machine learning powered uh, deep fakes. Um, there's clearly a lot of, a lot of FUD 
around AI. And do you think that sort of damages our progress in the long term, or is it all just a blip? Yeah, it's all a blip. Like AI has already been through several hype cycles. It's going to go through more hype cycles. You know, the, the history is usually the big first movers don't become incumbents. Like nobody heard of Google and Facebook and Amazon before they became big. You know, it was IBM, Digital Equipment, Sun Microsystems, they're all gone. So like there's going to be multiple blips. There's going to be, you know, both funny and, you know, somewhat scary, you know, issues, but it's, you know, the human race is pretty big and resilient and there's lots and lots of smart people. And um, yeah, well, it's going to elaborate out all over the place. You know, it's, it's happening as we speak. You know, am, am I worried about it? I am definitely curious. It's going to be a it's going to be a wild ride. Okay, you you, know, you did it like again. The last twenty five years have been wild. Yeah. You, you actually did it again. Are you sure we're not in a simulation? <laughs> because the next nope. thing I was going to ask is <laughs> well, no, no. Here's here's the really funny part. Okay, so, here we go. Like it. If you were going to build a simulation, you would build in a bunch of things that, like, let's say, limit the computation you need. Like, the speed of light's cool because you can't really see what's going on over there because there's a limit. To, you, like, things don't interact all at once. And the uncertainty <laughs> principle is really cool because when you look at something really closely, it gets a little bit undefined. <laughs> we live in a... Here's my favorite part of the universe. We live in a universe that's governed by three principles. The uncertainty principle the incompleteness theory, and the un unprovability problem. <laughs> so it's uncertain, incomplete, and unprovable. <laughs> if you were building a simulation, those would be some pretty good rules to put into it because that would massively limit the amount of computation you have to do. Um, so. Okay, so what I was going to bug you with then is, I mean, NVIDIA very publicly, uh, very loudly dropped 10% of their valuation today. And... Every time, right, every time something like this happens, um, you get people on both sides going, no, no, it's real, it's real to the moon. You get people on the other side going, it was a bubble. They're talking whether it's a dot-com bubble or whether it's Web 3.0 or they're, they're pointing at some other hype bubble. Um, what is... Both companies are bubbles. Yeah, can, can, can both of those things be true was my That's question. That yeah 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 that's like that's capitalism somebody said oh that company's just kicking the can down the road and somebody else said duh that's how companies work right so what does get stability dollars there's no right. stability okay there's, there's no, no stability stab okay then well there's a dynamic stability in the sense that there will be always be 100 top companies but those companies change continuously like the the myth is Oh, the, you know, the super rich will always be rich. That's mostly not true. The super big companies will always be big. That's not true. Like, there's virtually no companies that are 100 years old that are still viable. Uh, right. speaking so everybody's of, got their day in the sun. So Okay, speaking of which, changing. you're at the helm of a company now. My understanding is this is your first mm -hmm. time in the CEO position. Is that correct? It is. Okay, so I was going to ask you, with that knowledge, right, like uh, well, one, of, one of the really famous quotes from someone, I can't remember who because I'm terrible at names, but um, mm -hmm. a really famous quote that I, that I read at one point was that good leaders lead a company, great leaders put the company on a path such that when they leave, it becomes better than it was with their leadership. Um, and, you know, you just said it, right? Like, there's very few companies <laughs> that are like 100. wishful thinking. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I, pff, okay, yeah, yeah. but, well, hold on, hold on. Let me, let me finish the question before you predict my whole thing and answer it. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, knowing that you know, 100 years is an awful long time for a single company to stay viable, you know, what does your leadership look like? Is it an in the trenches leadership? Is it a set the vision and let people do it leadership? How are you, find, how are you finding it? Mm. Well, yeah, I, I'd say I like to do both. I, I like visionary leaders. Um, I worked in you know, Steve Jobs, Apple, and I worked for Elon. And I learned a lot from those guys. They, they both... They are both visionary leaders, but they're also really hands-on people. 
like Steve Jobs worked on products every day. Now I did he didn't work directly with that many people, but I worked for a guy I talked to him literally a couple times a day, Mike Colbert, who's a brilliant guy. And it was very hands on and very knowledgeable about everything we were doing. And you know, and Elon's the same way. It's like he's a he's a wonder in terms of how many different technologies and stuff he can say useful things and have insights about. And he likes everybody to be hands on. So yeah, I'm I'm into the hands on thing. So now, I, I'm a believer in what's called cre collective creativity, and I like people to own stuff and feel empowered to go do it. I played the fuck around the find out video for my whole company on an all hands meeting. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's, it's fun. <laughs> and that's, you know, so I like people to get stuff done and, you know, but also to own it, and it's okay to screw it up and fail and as long as you learn something and try it. So it's complicated to be a leader. If you just tell people what to do, they don't do a very good job. If you just pay attention to vision, that's not enough. Um, you have to be ready to willing to work with people and find people like like good people that work for me. I have some really good uh, technical and organizational managers, and they're pretty hands-on people. They know what they're doing, but they also know how to give people space to go do something useful. And it's com it's a combination of things. You got to do both. Okay, well, tell me what There's success no looks like. Pretend story. Yeah. Every year we get to build better computers, and we we build products our customers like, and uh, we keep going. But here's a funny one. So, when I was at digital, we used to joke that we'd build computers till the money ran out, and then the money ran out, and we went bankrupt. So I went to A and D, and I told somebody that joke, and they said. Jesus, the money runs out here all the time. We've been bankrupt like three times. <laughs> Jerry Sanders just, you know, he goes borrows some money or cuts a big deal. So, like, like run, running out of money was not an AMD problem. And when I went back to AMD, we were like months from bankruptcy. And uh, Jensen's famous for telling everybody they'll be bankrupt in a month, you know, for most of the company's life. And, and so, now, like, you, you build stuff. As Steve Jobs said, you're only as good as your next product. Right, I believe that. Like people build a great product and they think, now we made it. Not in technology. No, you go make a better product. Or the, the market changes or the customers want something different. Or, or you'll learn something new or somebody else learns something new that you didn't know about. So yeah, success for me is, you know, I want a team that's you know, engaged and interesting and we're building useful stuff and we build stuff that somebody wants. And then my expectation is we'll have to go build something else. Like, keep going. Of course, we were going to have some questions about your time at AMD. Uh, Hector asks, okay. uh, you returned during a challenging time, which <laughs> you've alluded to just now. Um, uh -huh. What was the morale like? What, was, where, was it, was it, it was fight? Bad. Was it flight? Uh, resignation. Ooh, apathy. Yeah, so when I the joined worst. there, so... so, so so I'd worked at AMD. I, I liked the, like when I was in AMD in 98, 99, something like that. Um, I liked the culture of, it's a teamwork culture. Um, Apple was much more of a hard edge, do the best excellence, you know, reward the top kind of culture. Um, so I was, I was intrigued. I knew, I thought they were going bankrupt when I joined. Um, it was closer than I thought. They had fired a third of the people. I think we ultimately laid off over half the company. Um, but the people that were there liked each other. Um, do you know the expression, the rats leave the sinking ship? There weren't many rats at AMD when I got there. They had all left. And the people that were there were often tactically very good, and they were good to work with. So, and I thought it would be fun to figure out how to turn the company around. Yeah, I, well, and it I didn't was gonna... work, you know, like I just get another job. It's like, like I wasn't really worried about jobs, so. So I went in there sort of knowing, you know, what's going on. There were some things that, to be honest, were worse than I thought. Yeah, you know, nobody like talks the about the rat that, that um, voluntarily swims back to the sinking ship. So I, it, yeah. put us yeah, in your, that's, yeah, that's put me. us in Is your that head. What you're trying to say. <laughs> yeah, well, I, mean, I, I call a spade a spade. <laughs> well, I was friends with Mark Papermaster, and I said I wanted to lead the CPU team, and they wanted me to be the architect. And I thought I could never pull this off if. I'm the architect and somebody else manages this to people because building a great product takes a combination of architecture, teamwork, organization, 
all kinds of stuff. And uh, I had managed like 500 people before, but I read a book about it. It's not that hard. <laughs> Actually, to be honest, I read 10 books about it. I hired a consultant who was excellent about this kind of stuff. Okay, so it's a little and, bit hard then. <laughs> yeah, 10 books. <laughs> it took a couple of weeks. <laughs> but, right, uh, it was really on. fun. And then, well, uh, Rory Reed was CEO at the time, and I told him I had to cancel all the projects and start over. And he's like, "Yeah, nobody cares if you know if we have like a 50 percent of the competition or 53." And uh, <laughs> you know, go ahead and do it. So I had a lot of freedom, and then a lot of people had a lot of good ideas. You know, it wasn't just me. Like, so we kind of unlocked it, you know, and. I'd say a lot of people didn't believe in the product. Some of them didn't believe it right till it was finished. Really? Because they were well, so used to AMD losing. Yeah. Well, hold on a second. How does that happen? Th okay, this is something that maybe is does not. Oh, engineers speak are very determined people. They can work on something they know is never going to work, but they're having fun doing their part, and they just soldier on. Like it's, it's okay, fun. but hold on a second. And maybe this isn't your problem, because you know you can tell yeah. just from the blunt honesty that you, you haven't spent a day in marketing in your life. Um, but oh, I'm great at marketing. I can, I can sell you your own shirt. Like, <laughs> that's a book about it. It's not that hard. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but help me out here, because this is something that blows my mind, is... A product will arrive, and us monkeys, who basically are just like, I don't know, ooh, 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 run game, you know, measure frames per second, yeah, yes. are sitting here going, hey guys, you got the pricing way wrong. You're at, you're at, you're at 80% of the competition, and you're priced 20% higher. And you get people who presumably talk to people who worked on the bloody thing, and they're like, oh, really? And you just kind of go, whoa, 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 whoa. where does this disconnect come from? How could you possibly be, help me with this, how could you possibly be an architect or, or someone working on Zen? You got your nose right up against this thing and you go, I don't know, maybe this thing's shit, I have no idea. How does that happen? How can we tell and they can't? I'm sorry, what question you're asking? Okay, the question you're like, saying. Some of the people working yeah. on Zen, up until the very end, you go, yeah, they didn't they didn't believe in it. How's that even possible? Because they're seeing... They well, see they, the, they'd worked on the previous product that wasn't any good, and, you know, they just assumed this wouldn't be... I don't know. But they got like, the I same... I would tell people what we were doing, and they would look at me like, Jim, we could never do that. We're not that good or something. I don't know. <laughs> so here's a funny thing. So a friend of mine told me this years ago. So every company will tell you, we only hire the best. We're the smartest people in the world. And what he said is that 100 people, you can have a really like excellent group. And at 1,000 people, you can be above average. And at 10,000, all companies are average. Like it's true, just by statistics. Now, there's a question about whether you lead from the top or the middle. Like there's a bunch of management theories about this. And then... There's, there's a lot of problems with how you do things, and then there's this uh, risk-reward. If you have an okay design and you want to make it 10% better, it might be really hard. But if you do a new design game 30% better, you can do it. But the risk of that's way higher. And so people make bad risk-reward trade-offs. Like the existential risk of being 50% the performance of your competition was 100%. And yet they were doing low-risk 5% moves. Right. So we said, hey, let's build Zen to be just as fast as, I think it's, we started out, I said, we'll, we'll beat Haswell, which was a processor competition at the time, and which, by the way, was shooting behind the duck a little bit, because we assumed Intel would keep moving. But as That you know, was my next question, bit, was how much, how much was, did Intel which was handy. save AMD <laughs> by just stagnating yeah. like that? I mean, 50%. okay, that's 50%. a lot. Now, you need a good design. Hey, and, and somebody said... Uh, he always told me I was I, I did not bet on luck enough because you know I, I do what I can and I assume everybody else is doing what they can but I, I didn't see that coming so I think that was pretty handy for them <laughs> yeah a little bit and, uh, so tell me right now but it was a good design and it was clean so one of the things people don't realize is when we built Zen you know we had a pretty clean architecture and redid the cat tools, the methodologies, the flows and stuff. And then, you know, Zen 1, 2, 3, 4, they were able to make pretty good progress. And then what happens is at some point progress starts to slow down 
because you really need to do a big, either a from scratch or a big rewrite, and then, you know, to get on the next curve, and that's 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 one of those complicated things. Now tell me this. Um, Right now, realistically, the 800-pound gorilla in the space is, is not Intel. It's, it's NVIDIA. Um, or mm-hmm. unless you disagree, in which case I would love to, I'd love no, to hear is. about it. Okay, it good. So we're yeah. on the same page and there. And it's still founder-led, and Jensen is a really smart guy. So are, you, it's not only a... are you shooting behind the duck? Are you shooting ahead of the duck? Where, where, what are you guys targeting? Because you're trying to disrupt NVIDIA, essentially, if, I, if no, I'm, I'm not, not mistaken. No, you're I don't not. care about NVIDIA. Okay, then tell, me, tell me what duck you're aiming There's at. There's so many. It's a huge. AI is a huge market. NVIDIA builds very expensive, very high performance, very high power products that people like, right, with very high gross margins. Turns out there's a big market for smaller AI engines, open source software, licensable IP, chips they can buy and put in their own products. Like, that's not a $100 billion market. I don't need that. I'd die and go to heaven at $500 million in revenue. So, so I'm building products for other people. Now, some of our products, I think, are really effective. And, you know, we'll see. But it's going to take a while to, you know, to do that. And I have literally more business right now than I can deal with. And, you know, we're working on, you know, delivering hardware and software. And, you know, we'll see what happens. Now, um, and, and then the other piece is, I think the AI revolution's just started from a computer architecture point of view. And also, there's going to be an interesting revolution in how we build general purpose computing. So one thing I want to do, this is you know, personally, is I want a really good AI and CPU design that I can then iterate on as software and models and a whole bunch of things change. And so we design with conscious intent. Like our AI engine is clean and simple. Right? Our software stack, you can go read it, read it yourself. Right. It's pretty straightforward. We're getting really good performance on it. And we have a whole bunch of stuff coming in the next six months that raises the bar on it. But if we had to say, hey, there's this new model, go rewrite the software, I don't have 2,000 people with 20 years of technical debt of software. I have 100 great people writing software, and the software stack's clean. And same with the CPU, RS5 CPU, is, it's going to be super fast. But it's a brand new design with brand new architecture, and it's really clean. And if we want to, you know, radically change it, I can do it. I'm not stuck because, you know, somebody's CPU that's been iterated on for 10 years where three quarters of the code was written by people who don't even work there anymore. Like, like we have, we own our own stuff, which is pretty fun. So I'll give you a funny example. So everybody told me, you know, especially there was a big debate about autonomous driving. Should it be driven by a C program that makes the decisions or an AI model. And the assumption was the AI model is this murky, you know, thing that inputs go in and outputs come out and you don't know what the AI code is doing. And they had it exactly wrong. The C program was 5 billion lines of code written by 100 people over five years. They had no idea how that C program (laughs) worked. But the weird part is it doesn't have a proper loss function. Whereas the AI model, you trained it with a known data set, and when you train it, you know exactly what its error properties are. So which one's better? The AI model you built yesterday from scratch with a known data set with a known error function? Or the C program written by a whole bunch of people over time that nobody knows how it works? I don't know. So (laughs) one of the things I want to do is, you know, build the next generation of computing in a world that's changing fast. So I'm not worried about the 800 pound gorillas because they don't, they don't move as fast. Speaking of that, also, um, yeah. sorry, go for it's it. It's a fun thing. Uh, do you see other competitors in the risk five space as almost like teammates helping legitimize risk five or yeah. do you see? Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. So like like these, yeah, Rebus these... just got Rebus just got funding. The its company is run by a friend of mine. They got some really good designers. I wish them the best. Sci-Fi is a good company. Krista who was one of the original pretty good Berkeley guys, as you pointed out, um, <laughs> that helped build the Risk Five architecture. Uh, Andy's is a really great company. Their CEOs—he's a character I really like him a lot. 
they're driving they're driving yeah. real stuff. I know the Ventana guys. Yeah, like the CPU market's huge. Yeah. Right. And to be honest, you know, having five. So x86 was the original open source architecture, right? They licensed it to like six, seven companies. And the reason it built the 80, 6800, 6502 um, was because those were single source proprietary architectures and x86, the original 8086 was open. Now it's, it's become proprietary with two, you know, duopoly, you know, controlling it, but it was the open architecture. That's why it won. It didn't win because it was better. All those CPUs were, were crap. Um, and small and arbitrary. Speaking of there being Mets only... Oh, okay. Uh, speaking of there being only two, uh, we got our hands very recently, I'm about to tease an upcoming video here, on a Centaur processor that, uh, well, it's obviously it never mm -hmm. actually made its way to, um, to the market, but Centaur Halls, uh, it's an 8-core, it's clocked at 2.5 gigahertz, and it seems to have risen out of the ashes of uh, VIA. Yeah, not, um, mm -hmm. yeah there, I, I haven't followed that for a while. Well, no one's cool. followed it for a while. It's been dead for a while. But their concept uh -huh. was on CPU AI, kind of like what you just alluded to, that was very affordable. Mm -hmm. uh, they were targeting 500 bucks for this chip uh, with on-chip AI uh, or with, with on, on die AI, um, and it just couldn't get over the line. Was the problem x86? Was the problem just they didn't have a good enough team? If you don't know much about it, that's totally fine. It just yeah, was, it was a funny that. coincidence that we made a video about it this week and that you brought up that, that kind of, that concept. Um, okay, so yeah. if you're not... I don't know. It turns out, you know, building AI hardware and software that works is, is harder than it looks, let's say. Like uh, my friend Roger Godori said, every AI company in the middle of it, there's a mole ad unit. Like, and everybody can build one. But building, like, AI is complicated because it's a general purpose computer that runs AI programs. So you need all the layers. You can't just build a, uh, an AI engine with a compiler that runs a couple benchmarks. You know, there's firmware, there's drivers, there's security, there's interrupts, there's every single piece of it and the thing we've been working on is elaborating out that full stack you know, on that subject you know, from top to bottom and and then the other is a lot of people tried to make a, a a dent in the market with one chip and it's relatively small you know so like to drive a car it's going to be a couple pedal flops to good to run like real-time video um we're building a computer which we think will run real-time video in a single box at a reasonable price, but it's expensive. It's a, it's a big AI engine. It's not a five hundred dollar, you know, two hundred teraflop chip. It's, 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 it's pretty serious. Okay, so let me jump That's in fine. with yeah. what was going to be my next question from Ricky. Um, like you said, hey, it turns out AI, pretty hard. Driving a car, pretty hard. I mean, uh, Mr. Musk has famously promised us that full autonomous driving is X amount of time away. Um, I, I, I kind of am wondering if he had a, an early point in his career where he worked at Valve at this point when it comes to giving ETAs for things. Um, and, I, and Ricky wanted me to ask you, okay, how far are we really away from full self-driving? Because I got to tell you, I am relatively speaking an idiot. But when we got the promise that, you know, full self-driving was going <laughs> to be... Can you drive a car? I can. Well, like, it, okay. Oh, I'm, so you, you can... <laughs> at least so I'm smarter than your cars, computer. So it doesn't seem like, like we don't really need AGI to drive cars, it turns out. Cause, okay, yeah, so... it's pretty funny. What I was trying to say is... <laughs> Relatively speaking, I'm an idiot, but I looked at the claim that, you know, every current, every current Tesla was going to be capable of full autonomous driving. And I went, there's no way. There's no way. Even knowing what I know, it's just there's absolutely no way that they have the kind of capabilities, even if I extrapolate, even if Tesla is, is 10x what everyone else is doing on the market right now. I just, I'm sorry, I don't buy it. Um... So how so so Ricky asks me to ask, how far are we away from true, like level four, level five, true full self driving? 
Give me, give me yeah, a spitball. So, so, well, my favorite, my favorite crack about Elon is he turns the impossible into late, and then people complain about it like crazy. <laughs> 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 and I always thought that that's pretty good. Um, <laughs> Got to raise money somehow. <laughs> it, yeah, well, sure. You know, kick the can down the road, build some products. Like their cars are great. I, I have two of them. So, and I like full self driving. I use it every day. And uh, it's a little quirky, um, but it's getting better. <laughs> no, uh, so there's building a big enough AI engine. So, so humans drive cars really well. I taught both of my daughters in you know a couple hours to drive a car, and it turns out they both have a general intelligence, right? And so for them, congratulations, is a subset of that. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. It's pretty good. I, I was thinking of A/B testing them, like, like I was going to have one of them like read the rules and then you know go for a drive, and then I was going to have the other one watch like a hundred million hours of video and then <laughs> see which one could drive faster. But my daughter Catherine, she told me to bug off. <laughs> She's like, no way, I'm watching like a hundred million hours of video to learn to drive a car, Dad. <laughs> She learned it like eight minutes flat. Like, so the, the general intelligence seems to be a really good thing. Now, the problem in the cars today is we're trying to put a small AI engine there and get the maximum performance out of it. Yeah. So Waymo, I'm in San Francisco right now. They drive around with no drivers in the car. It's pretty spooky. And, you know, that's a fairly heavy-handed solution because it's got a shitload of sensors. Sensors everywhere, no yeah. It's mosquitoes wild. and all that stuff. Whereas Elon would say, like, a one-eyed guy with 2200 vision could drive a car, and, you know, you don't have to be that smart. Now, that, <laughs> that causes a trade-off, because yeah. the smaller the computer, the better the software has to be. So I think if you put, I don't know, five petaflops in a car with some of the new good transformer models, you could drive a car pretty fast. But there's another weird thing, which is humans aren't data intelligence. We're computationally intelligent. Like, you didn't get smart by watching hundreds of, you know, millions of hours of anything. Don't, don't like tell my audience that. that when you, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, maybe you watched hundreds of hours in the last week. But it's only, you know, tens of thousands of hours. It's not that much information. Like, we get some information. We essentially learn to simulate the world. So, you, you know, I don't know if we live in a simulation, but our brain sure is a simulation. And we haven't, we haven't really cracked the AI problem of building really smart systems that, like, simulate themselves and essentially create intelligence with simulation. They, they're creating intelligence with data prediction, uh, which seems pretty smart, but it doesn't seem like – it's not close to what we actually do. I want to loop back arguments like, yeah, that – well, people get a lot of data from from vision, but blind people are smart too. Like, you don't you don't need to see anything to be smart. And that's I want to state at all. I want to loop back around to one of my earlier questions, and this is obviously going to be a little bit of uh, mm -hmm. crystal ball gazing, and I don't expect you to have a good answer for it. But I, you know, I asked, okay, how much of a generational improvement is we just didn't think of that versus we just didn't have the capability right now you're really focused on AI, you're focused on risk five. That's, that much is very obvious. Mm -hmm. um, but I have to imagine, for someone like you, talking to the people you do talk to, you gotta have some idea of what the next thing is. I mean, obviously, um, you know, Jensen had some idea where he was going with CUDA while everyone else was sitting there going, why don't I just have more FPS on my stupid gaming thing, right? You know, what? Is there a risk five replacement that is that is you know two two cells dividing right now? Um, where are we going? Well, let, let's say it a different way. So, so your brain, you know, there's there's this theory about you had a primitive brain, then a motor cortex, and then an emotional brain, and then you know, cerebral cortex. So our brain evolved to add layers. Like our cerebral cortex is essentially a high end planning machine. And so, obviously, animals survive just fine without one. And then when it started to grow, you have to ask, like, what was it for? And it could be it helped model the world better and, and create better planning with better outcomes. And at some point, the uh, cerebral cortex took over. Most people think they live there in their head. 
So you could do things really fast with direct connections through your motor cortex. But most of the you that you believe is you, if you believe in that kind of thing, seems to be your thought press in your higher level thinking. So today AI computers are treated as accelerators to general purpose computation. That's gonna flip pretty soon. AI computers are, are gonna treat general purpose computers like a motor cortex. So there'll be AI things running to do stuff and occasionally they'll say, generate a deterministic program to do something, right? as opposed to deterministic programs calling up AI modules. So that flip is coming pretty fast. And Interesting. the way we think about programming, like you were talking about, well, how are we going to run the old games? None of that's yeah. going to exist. Like, and even stuff as simple as video is going to be all generated. Like, nobody's in 10 years going to watch a movie. Like, you're going to live in a movie. Right, it's going to be all real-time generated, and you're going to interact with it. And you're going to ask your favorite character, "What the hell's going on?" They're going, "Shut up! I'm shooting somebody." <laughs> like, this, like, like this is going to happen faster than you think, and like so, all the mediums we think about are toast, and all the software that's ever been written is going to be gone, like 100 percent. I mean, obviously, there's going to be a ton Pretty of resistance fast. to this. I mean, there'll be a corner. There'll be a guy with a rotary phone and, a, and an iPhone and a, a Java program or something. But it, w it won't be material to your everyday life. So, okay, I guess I'm about to ask you to, and feel free to ignore this question if you're just like, look, I don't need the uh, well, I don't I need one the more if mail. you want it. So, yeah, I'm a, I'm a believer in um, we're going to... Like, like, we're going to use AI to rethink a lot of science. And, right. Uh, so human beings, like, we have this idea of, like, you get the idea of a theory, you have a prediction. The problem is <clears throat> you get trapped in your theories. And so then new data comes along, and you can't really in interpret it into your theories. So all our science is, is, you know, it's elaborated from a bunch of ideas, but they're all human ideas, and they can't compensate encompass all the data. And, okay. and I think science is going to go through a fairly big revolution. I'm still going to see if I can get a hot but, take out of you. Yeah. Um, when okay, you cool. see, for example, you see the, uh, I think you've, you've brought up entertainment a couple times. You brought up gaming, you brought up film. Uh, when you see, for example, the Actors Union uh, negotiating to keep generative AI out of film and music, out of art, uh, you know, what's your, what's your take on that? This has happened a lot. You know, there was a big split, of, you know, supposedly in Europe, I read it in the history books that, you know, Austria banned, like, knitting, you know, weaving machines and, and clothing mills and all that stuff because they didn't want the people to lose all their jobs. And England embraced it and, you know, one won and one lost. So, yeah, so the writers' unions will say, you can't use this for this movie it'll create a whole new area where they don't exist and people will generate all kinds of stuff and, and so technology change usually means you you get on you get on board you get left behind you know now i think there'll still be writers there'll still be books there'll still be movies made by people for people there's all kinds of stuff like that like you you can buy machine made clothing but people buy knitted clothing people people like what people do and, you know, that's a really great thing. You know, we, we like artists. Like, you can get a perfect painting by somebody printed, but you still buy the painting from the artist that you talk to because it's at some level more interesting. But, yeah, keeping AI out of this and that and the other thing is going to be a hard fail. I want uh, the last sort of big one. I know you should probably, I think we've kept you longer than we said we would. I'm very sorry for that, but oh, I promise we're getting, we're getting close to the end. Um, we haven't talked about Atomic Semi at all. And this time I'm coming in without having done any pre-briefing because I, like I said, it kind of slipped under my radar. Um, you say yeah, you're you focused. That that's, I'm, I'm at the office. That's, that's an atom. Okay, I did know it was an atom, but is that the logo? Is that the logo for the company? Yeah. Or Okay, cool. Yeah. So... All I know is you guys are working on low cost fabrication equipment. Like when you say fabrication equipment, you mean like like ASML fabrication equipment? What, what are yeah, we talking exactly, about here? Yeah, exactly, but smaller. 
Yeah, like a little little tiny one like that. So you want to what, what your wafer is 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 like five centimeters or why? Tell tell me about the, okay even smaller. Help me help me. So so the semiconductor technology is great today, and all the equipment is great. Yeah, and it got optimized to make very large wafers that move very fast. Yes, right. You know, they're twelve inches around. Like the thing that holds it weighs fifty kilograms and it moves. So yep. if you look at all the machines, it's it's really hard to build and heavy and all kinds of stuff. Yeah, you got to right. account for seismic stability of the land. Make sure there's no ancient burial grounds under it. Yeah, that sort yeah, of thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. like yeah, it's, it's amazing, <laughs> right? So, so I met this kid Sam Zulu. Like he made made a fab in his garage in high school. He is a YouTube videos about it, and then I met him when he was in college, and we started talking about what it would mean to go build a set of equipment where you could make a fairly high tech chip, really fast, but just make one chip at a time, and then optimize the crap out of it, because you're not solving the problem of moving 50 kilograms at you know 100 miles an hour, and you're not trying to keep something perfectly flat over a huge surface, like basically change the game and make something way, way simpler. And then take advantage of, like there's hundreds of billions of dollars of material research being done. You can atomic, you can deposit atomic layers of almost any material, single atom at a time, it's beautiful. So is the goal to so be we like- we decided to go- Sorry, go for it. Well, my personal goal is to go make a, a really interesting chip really fast. And- uh, it, it feels like you know, the 3D printing- Like one of our investors said it's, yeah, it's yeah, three, yeah. It's basically three D printing, you know. Compared to injection molding, right? Yeah. Where you ha you don't have to deal with the enormous yeah. scale, huh? Yeah. So, now the weird thing is, if you make them fast enough, it could be for more than prototyping. Right, which also, also happened with three D printing. This is, uh, yeah. Well, three D printing is amazing, and it just keeps getting better and better, and goes into more stuff. And then there's really fun stuff like you three D print molds and then injection mold that. Like what you can do today with the combination of, of modern CAD tools, 3D printing, injection molding, and then CNC and all kinds of stuff. It's it's fantastic. And yeah, so we're we're into building our own machines that make chips and you know, using an unbelievable amount of material science research. They publish everything. You can buy any 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 atomic layer deposition material you want for almost nothing. It's crazy. Yeah, it's super fun. Okay. Which, um, I, I mean, this is, it's, it's almost like a chicken egg uh, question, right? Like, which, uh, which comes first for you in terms of, of taking tense torrent to the next level, in terms of, um, of taking atomic semi to the next level? Do they drive each other? Like, is this an attempt to, to yeah, be maybe someday. real men own fabs? Yeah. You know, as the, the famous quote, right? Yeah, like, I, is, yeah I have a fab, is that I have a goal? computer sun company, I have AI software, sure. <laughs> why not, right? Yes, why not? What are you doing this? I mean, like, like a lot of people are here, like, what are you up to? It's like, like damn! <laughs> Boom, roasted. I, make I know, videos. it's like, people, <laughs> hey, this planet might get hit by an asteroid or blown up by a volcano, man. I want to make sure that gets stopped. <laughs> I'm, I'm hustling. You know, right. it's like they had a backup planet, but, you know, we got, we got big problems right here. So, yeah, we got to get moving. All right. Well, on that note, I think this is a perfect time for us to say thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, preemptively, you know, I'd like to get out there and uh, make it so that you can't say no because it's in front of 10,000 people and say we'd love to have you on again sometime. I know that Tense Torrent has sure. some really cool stuff coming and we'd love to take a look at it once that's a little more baked and once you guys are ready to kind of engage with mm -hmm. us, do some videos together. Uh, we'd love to maybe have you come on for a you know a deeper look at you know the the normie version that we publish on the main channel maybe we can have a chat about it after um oh, this I has been this was the normie version this, this has this been is, no this is the really the dialed in version. audience nice. yeah this is <laughs> oh, okay. yeah. yeah this is the guys yeah, that'll great. sit and listen to us for four hours a week uh this is uh, the wan show so oh. um guys if you could just give us uh give us some applause in the chat for mr jim keller mm -hmm. um 
really appreciate you taking this time on a Friday night. Uh, get to your family, please, sir, and uh, hope to talk okay. again soon. Okay, great. Hey, great talking with you guys. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. That was great. All right. Oh, maybe we should do interviews more. Man, <laughs> that was a lot of fun. And like I knew from watching some of his other interviews that his answers to things were going to be extensive, but I was like, I want to make sure I'm prepared. So I had all these questions. We got through, I don't know, a 20th of what I wanted to talk about. And we didn't get through like <laughs> almost any of those. <laughs> and then you had your own. <laughs> it's just like, that's why I oh, preempted. Man. That's why I got out ahead of it. Because I knew time? you had yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, and his, uh, his staff told me, because I was like, look, realistically, you know, we don't want to take up a ton of his time. Yeah, we don't want I the do wench. Now. We don't want the wench show to be nine hours long. Um, <laughs> I do now. Could we? Could we maybe schedule? Could we maybe ask him for twenty minutes? Because I wanted to be super reasonable, and they were like, mm, "I'll tell you what. You don't want that. <laughs> we'll put we'll put twenty minutes on the thing, but we're gonna tell Jim some other amount of time that's longer because people get talking to Jim and then." I mean, is time even yeah. real anyway? Yeah. Uh, that was so much fun. Uh, obviously, we do have to move on into our next topic. Uh, yeah, I'm. Ah, man, I, yeah, that was that was a blast. That, um, that could have gone on forever. I think. Let's talk about Marquez Brownlee destroys the economy. <laughs> <laughs> what a pivot! <laughs> Is AI going to destroy the economy? No. No, it will, it will, be, be, it will be a YouTuber. So this is obviously our headline topic for the uh. video today. Uh, a review of Humane AI's AI pin by MKBHD has received a surprising amount of backlash, with at least uh. one detractor calling it, and this is a quote, almost unethical irresponsible and careless this particular critic even made an implicit reference to a doctor's hippocratic oath first to do no harm several business influencers followed his lead framing marquez as being some kind of powerful reviewer heartlessly killing other people's nascent projects um this is despite some of these business influencers claiming that he bankrupted a company in 41 seconds. So, sorry, what? Um, okay, so there's, a, there's a lots of problems here. So number one, Humane AI is not currently bankrupt. Um, number two, they received a lot of equally negative coverage from people other than Marquez. He just happens to be a particularly high-profile person. And number three... Humane AI staff seem to be largely unperturbed by his review, and their social media head, Sam Sheffer, called it an honest, solid review with fair and valid critiques. This is another I quote. I think it helps that Sam is a very experienced person who came from the media side, actually. So, like, he's he's been on the other side of this. He understands it. It, it makes sense that he would have a well-reasoned, appropriate response. Um, Marquez himself has commented on the controversy, saying that a negative review is very unlikely in and of itself to kill a product or a company without there being other factors involved. He also stated that his reviews are not to inform or um, entertain businesses. They are to inform and entertain consumers um, and that you shouldn't really get that all confused. So I would just like to say heartily that I agree uh, as a reviewer, you don't owe a brand that sends you a product for review anything. The deal is, and I laid this you out. Can't. I laid this out back when Hardware Unboxed was under fire from NVIDIA. Uh, or rather not, um, NVIDIA was under fire for their treatment of Hardware Unboxed. And you had these people coming out and saying, well, look, you know, hmm. You know what? I'm not going to name any names. But there were people, both on the company side, some companies, let's not name any names, and on the audience side that had this understanding of a reviewer's role. Like, the second you're reviewing something, you are part of the marketing strategy for this product, or that you, um, or that you owe somebody anything. That is not how this works. You get the product, you evaluate it, with the knowledge and with the tools that you have at your disposal. And if you like it, there is a huge benefit. There's an enormous benefit because an unbiased 
video or article about a product is going to have a much larger impact than paid advertising. If that weren't the case, and I promise you this, I cross my heart and I give you my personal Linus Tech Tips, trust me bro guarantee. If that were not the case, companies would only advertise. They wouldn't engage with independent media at all. Why take the risk? Because the other side of that coin, right? The other side of that coin, you get this huge boost if an independent media says your product is great and recommends to buy it, but if they don't like it, it stings. You don't run that risk with paid media. We went through a similar thing. We sent our screwdriver out. Well, we've gone through things on all sides of all well, kinds of yeah, things when it comes enough. to saying whether a product is good or not <laughs> and having people be into it or not. <laughs> I just mean, uh, but I anyway, just mean on the yeah, product side. Yeah, let's we talk have, about we have it. been on the product Let's side. talk about it from the manufacturer side. Yeah, yeah. Do you want to run well, it? I thought you, you were to going to. No, so, no, like, no. We, I mean, we sent it to look, Project I had, Farm. I had the Luke experience for an hour just that now. That was genuinely <laughs> hilarious. I was trying not to laugh every time. I could see you physically reacting, and I'm like, yeah, welcome to welcome to the world. Um, yes. That was epic. Uh, I, <laughs> I'd i like you to go ahead and tell your story now. No, I'm doing it on purpose right now. <laughs> um, no, yeah, we, we sent it to a bunch of different reviewers, um, and every time that we knew a review, because we would often, like, There'd be some form of communication of like when the video would come out, but they often wouldn't tell us what like the results were because that makes sense. Um, so like we, we would know a video was coming out on a certain day and there was so much anxiety because we have a lot of belief in the product. But you don't know, like they might test it in some weird way that we we didn't think of or whatever. Like you don't necessarily know what's going to happen. They might not like the feel for whatever reason. Yeah, like, they might just plain not f***ing like it. Maybe they just think it's ugly. Like who, who knows, right? And then yep. the videos would come out and then, oh, great. Everybody seems to love it. But like it's, it's, it's a tense moment. And there's a degree of kind of knowing who you're sending something to. Like if I yeah. had a product that was functional but not particularly aesthetically pleasing, um, you know what? I you might send it to someone who's more into function over form. Yeah, I I might you know I'm not I I've decided not to name names. Um, but but I would I might pick and choose my reviewers a little bit if I had something that I thought was um, very 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 beautiful and 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 crafted. Um, you know I might send it to a, a completely different set. And don't imagine for a second that companies aren't playing this game and that they don't have a certain set of expectations. Um, again, a name I'm not going to name, but a very large technology channel that is not Marquez, but really, really big, told me that before engaging with them one time, there's a brand that had someone on their team go back and watch every single video they'd ever published. A, to make sure they were brand safe, and B, to get some idea of where their headspace was at and what they felt was important. Like, I'll tell you this much, Humane AI did not contact me. That tells you did everything we, you need to know about their confidence in the product from did we a reach out from a nuts and bolts practice. Oh, do you think they don't know who we are? Yeah, but did we reach out? We, I think we did at some point. I'm not sure. It would have been procurement team. Okay. But there is absolutely no way that if they if it had there's no way that there was a conversation at Humane AI that did not include what about LTT. And there is absolutely no way that if I was on that team, I would have greenlit sending us one. <laughs> Come on. What was I going to say about it? Was I going to talk about the design? I'd have been like, wow, how many, I'm sorry, how many pixels are in this fucking display? I was, I, I'm not going to lie. When, when some of the videos started coming out on it, I, I, I was often refreshing the LTT page looking for uh, the, the resurrection of kick farted, but... Unfortunately, it never happened. No, I mean, I, I'd be down to cover it. I think we, I thought we ordered one or this something. Point, it might be a little late. I haven't followed it up. Well, I don't know. I came up with a good title today. Oh. It doesn't matter how early or late your video is if you've got if a good title. If you've got title. that banger title. Yeah. That's true. Yeah, so I came That's up with true. a good title. It was it was like Marquez killed this product or something like that. Or like, I, I, I forget. Why but, did Marquez murder this? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Look how they massacred my boy. Um as long as you've got the title, it just really doesn't matter. So I'm, I'm definitely down to review it. I am intentionally not watching any coverage of it like I did with the Vision Pro. So Apple's a company that explicitly 
excludes us from any kind of early access or insider information on their products um, because they don't like the way we do things. That's fine. That's fair enough. But, um, <laughs> yeah. The, the cold, hard truth, the basic truth is that that's how independent media works. Everyone has their own methods. Everyone has their own processes. Everyone has their own biases. And the way that you engage is up to you. You're not obligated to send a product to anyone. Uh, the only reason that that whole thing with NVIDIA and Unbox Therapy blew up was because NVIDIA said the quiet part out loud. Apple is so Hardware careful. Unboxed? NVIDIA. Yeah, hardware unboxed. Yeah, did I, what did I say? Unbox therapy. Oh, did I, I'm sorry. Hardware unboxed. I'm just. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. The, the whole, the only reason that whole thing went down with hardware unboxed and Nvidia was because Nvidia said the quiet part out loud. They said, "Look, if you don't get on board with ray tracing and and beat this drum, we're not going to be able to seed you products anymore." Uh, well, okay. Apple's too smart for that. I just want, sorry, I just want to interject for something slightly off topic for a second just before I forget because I was supposed to do it at the beginning of the show, but then obviously uh, important things happened. Um, if you're watching on Flowplane, check out the beta.flowplane.com site. We just pushed a massive update, which you're going to notice probably nothing, but it's really big for us and we need bug reports. So if you use it, run into any problems, there's a form in the bottom left-hand corner. Click that. Let us know what's going on. Don't tell me in the Flowplane chat because I can't do anything about it right now, but use that form and let us know. It's a uh, we it's a complete removal of the Angular wrapper. It's all in React. It's a big deal. Anyways, sorry. Back on the topic. Avery Studio says MKBHD saved us from a junk product at the end. They can go cry on their pile of unwanted inventory, and that's that's 100% true. I mean, I, I made a comment a little while ago that I think got taken... Well, okay. Basically what I said was, look, um, I don't want anyone to buy this about a product. Um, and that was taken as like that I had some kind of bias or something. But no, and while I do come with my own set of experiences, obviously, and my own priorities, it was, it was not a bias. It was based on my direct experience with the product. And when I said I don't want anyone to buy it, it was that I don't want anyone to waste their money. That's my f***ing job is that you don't waste your money. And the reason that we've got, you know, as many subscribers as we do, the reason we have so many people watching right now is because a lot of you seem to have very similar priorities to me. And so what I tend to do is with my experience and with my priorities, I tend to lay out what the case is for, you know, you guys as best I can, or in some cases, like with something like the PS portal, lay out, okay, hold on a second. Let's go outside of your bubble for a second and talk about the use cases for people who are maybe not you. That's that's what I'm doing when I'm doing my best. And we have a responsibility to at least try to be consistent when it comes to the application of our, of our rules. So if on the one hand, we say, hey, this thing ain't baked, it's the worst thing I've ever seen, forget about it. And then on the other hand, we have a product and we say, this thing ain't baked, but I, you know, uh, I, I, I love it and I'm excited for the future anyway, then we better have a damn good justification yeah. for why we're applying these different standards <laughs> and we better explain it. Um, I think you probably saw something like that with our coverage of Intel Arc, where yeah, we basically absolutely. said, okay, look, we're rooting for this thing. Darn it, we're rooting for this thing. It isn't very good today, but here's why it's important. I... I'm going to do my gosh darndest best to, you know, try to see if this thing is usable at all. Um, but no, you know, I can't give it a, I can't give it a straight faced recommendation, but you've just, you've got to explain that. And what's frustrating, I think sometimes is that you can't count on people to get the whole story. I think a lot of people saw Marquez's title, which was initially the worst product I've ever reviewed or something like that. And they just look at that and they go, okay, well, that was all he had to say about it. Guys, I think his Gotta worst his worst crime was engagement bait, right? Which everybody has to do. Which realistically, we don't make the rules about. Yeah, I uh, yeah. Um, and you kind of owe it to yourself if this is something you're curious about to hear everything he has to say. Um, and you know what? Yeah, am I guilty of it sometimes? Reading just the headline, sure, we all are. But we can't be mad solely at a Marquez or an us or uh, whoever, you know, whoever in the media. We also have to be a little mad at ourselves for not getting more than one perspective. A, finish getting that perspective. And B, 
get a second perspective. I have always, always advocated for multiple perspectives. I have always advocated for a strong, diverse, independent media because the reality of it is, you know, you are not going to get the same perspective on even something that we, we all use in fundamentally the same way, right? Let's say an iPhone. What is it? Well, hold on a second. It's a computer in our pocket. Yeah, we all use it as that, but you might game on it. I might use it solely for telecommunications. Someone else might use it only once a month when they're not using their daily driver phone because they need to do a 3D scan of an environment. I don't know. That's why we need these multiple perspectives. And I think that for anyone, whether you're on the consumer side or the media side to say, you know, no, this is, this is the one source of truth and that truth wasn't right. How dare they? It's losing the entire plot. That's my spiel. Yeah. And it, it sucks because... Like, and furthermore... <laughs> uh, he's got to get back. That's fine. Um, <laughs> it was still so fun to watch. Um, also, I, I'm going to tangent again really quickly. I'm stoked that he was very receptive coming back on again because that was a fantastic conversation. Oh, Jim? Yeah. Yeah, that was yeah. sick. Anyways, jumping back to this. It sucks because like you... we, I think we all want to live in a space where companies are a little bit more brazen about the products that they make and, and are willing to take risks and, and make weird things and push limits and do stuff like that. And when you're in that environment, things will fail. Um, there's, there's, I, I don't know if he said it here or it's in an interview that I watched with him in it recently, because I think those things are going to blend in my head for a little while now. But um, he had a conversation where he was talking about how when creating Jimmy a product, me. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. You can aim for like 30% ahead. And you could do that every time if you wanted, but you're gonna it's a big risk. Or you can just aim for 10 percent ahead every single time and you'll probably hit more often. Um, and you it's fun. It's fun when the companies aim for 30% ahead. Yep. But they're gonna miss. And it's not our job to say great job, product amazing when they do Gold miss. Star. Yeah. Yeah. It's, Thanks for participating. Everyone go buy it so that they can make a better one for the people who didn't waste yeah. their f***ing money on this one. As much as we want companies to take those chances, it's a big risk on the company and it's our job to inform consumers. So if the thing sucks, you got to say it. Yep. And you need to you need to boil down why, because it's very possible, like your analogy with the iPhone, that someone won't care about all the reasons why you think it sucks. And they might see some of the reasons why it is good as enough justification for them to buy it. So it might be a product for them. And that's great. It doesn't necessarily mean anything. But like, yeah, I don't know. It's unfortunate, but it is what it is. And we're going to keep doing what we do. And so will everybody else. We sure are. I mean, uh. Better people than you have tried to stop us. <laughs> yeah. You know who hasn't tried to stop us? Our sponsors. These sponsors. <laughs> the show today is brought to you by MSI. If you're experiencing trouble streaming our latest float plane exclusive, consider upgrading your motherboard to the MSI Meg Z790 Ace Max for better Wi-Fi. It's equipped with the latest Wi-Fi 7, so you're looking at speeds and, okay, for real, though, like really, really flipping fast. It's absolutely incredible. So don't let buffering interfere with your enjoyment of your favorite content. By the way, we have a bunch of float plane exclusives up there. You will for sure enjoy the car break-in prank okay these are weird talking points but anyway uh sure we're we're pimping float plane in the middle of this msi sponsor read uh anyway <laughs> this board it's the ultimate powerhouse for your intel core next gen processor supporting 13th 12th uh, pentium gold celeron cpus uh so you're set for whatever the future throws at you plus it's got two thunderbolt four ports on board what am i even looking at here um that means super fast data transfers at 40 gigabit per second uh support for 8k displays and the convenience of daisy chaining when it comes to storage they've got you covered with five m.2 slots including one pcie 5.0 slot absolutely sick so check out their msi meg z790 ace max at the link down below the show is also brought to you by squarespace are you struggling to build a website after watching hours of tutorials online? Squarespace makes building a website super easy and everyone can do it. We use Squarespace to build our websites too. Even though Colton doesn't have any coding experience, he can make changes with just a couple of clicks. 
Squarespace is an all-in-one platform with a variety of customizable themes for your website. And with their award-winning designer templates, your business just looks so much more believable. Whether you're a local business, a blogger, or an artist, Squarespace has got you covered, and all their templates work seamlessly on mobile devices as well. With the new client invoicing functionality, you can communicate with clients, organize your work, and collect payments all on Squarespace. Plus, with 24-7 support, someone will always be there to answer your questions. Head to squarespace.com slash when to get 10% off today. Finally, the show is brought to you by Vessi. Are you running away from your responsibilities this weekend? You might run more comfortably with Vessi. Vessi makes comfortable and breathable shoes that, most importantly, are highly water resistant. They go as far as to say waterproof, so no puddle can stand in your way. They recently launched their Stormburst Low Top, which has the grip of a hiking boot in an easy on off design. Vessi offers all kinds of shoes for different occasions, so you can always find one that fits your routine, and their products are vegan and cruelty free. With their one-year warranty and over 10,000 reviews, don't let rain stop you from moving. We've got a ton of Essie lovers here in the office. Dennis's personal favorite is the Soho Sneaker, which is made with vegan leather and has a casual, formal look. Now you can get 15% off your first purchase at vessi.com slash wanshow. You can check that out at the link down below. All right. God tier transition. We're supposed to get into some merch messages here. For those of you who are new to the WAN Show, welcome. Yeah. And welcome to the concept of merch messages. I mean, you guys love throwing money at streamers and through your screen Product and posts. I get it. That's super cool, you know, super chats and Twitch bits and all that kind of stuff. But the way that I see it, you should get something in return for that money. They should throw something right back at you. And that's what merch messages is. All you got to do if you want to interact with the show is head over to lttstore.com. Check out our actually shockingly wide array of products. I forgot to offer Jim some merch. Okay, doesn't matter. The point is, we'll, we'll, we'll get something over to him. I can approximate his size based on him. Anyway, uh, the point is head over to lttstore.com. And in Whoa. the cart, you will see a little box whenever we're live that gives you the opportunity to send a merch message. It will go to to producer Dan, who will... What are you wearing? Is that just the moire from your... Can oh, I see. Okay. I don't know. It always does this. Cool. Okay. Well, it'll go to producer Dan, who will either reply to it directly, forward it to someone who can answer your question, or throw it down here, or finally curate it for me and Luke to read on the show. Uh, we've got uh, a few to go through right now, just to show you guys kind of how it works. So why don't we go ahead and get that started? Sure. Do you have an ETA on the mouse portion of labs? There is an explosion of mice on the market and would love to get some info on them. I'll never cash this gift card if it's sometime this year. Um, let me find out. In the meantime, do you want to read another one? Sure. Uh, let's see. Speaking of Berkeley, I'm curious if you have thoughts on the recent research paper showing that 55,000 plus VR users can be uniquely identified based on head and hand motion data captured in Beat Saber. I didn't hear about that. Uh, you ever heard of gait analysis as well? Just by how you yeah, walk? I know, I know yeah. gait analysis. I know that because my vision is bad, but I can identify who people are. By You've mentioned that to me a couple times. Yeah. yeah. So um, who owns Beat Games again? Facebook? <laughs> cool. Oh. <laughs> Beat Saber Barrett. It's, it's Facebook. Uh -oh. Meta, excuse me. Uh oh. Yeah, I know. Facebook. Right? Uh oh. Oh, man. Okay, well, let me find out about the mouse <laughs> thing anyway. Um, uh oh. Hi, Gary. You're live on the WAN show. Give me one sec. Um, the audience noted the absolute explosion in the gaming mouse market lately, and they were all, hey, when are you guys going to have your mouse testing for labs all figured out? Uh, mouse testing and lab should be figured out within the next 30 days. Um, we have all the equipment in. Uh, it's being set up right now by Antoine and Sharon. Um, and probably in about a week, a week or so, uh, we'll start early testing on it, but... Within about three, three to four weeks, uh, yeah, we, we should have results, and we'll get them up uh, for people to look at. Okay, and we'll have, uh, wh what are the main things we're focusing on? We're obviously going to have, like, click consistency or, or like, click uh, characterization graphs, right? We're going to be able right. to do acceleration. We're going to be able to do uh, tracking accuracy and precision. Any other major stuff that we're looking at? Latency, okay. 
No, I, that, that that covers most of it. So okay. Oh man. You know what would be really cool, Gary, that I just thought of, and I'm sorry I'm springing this to you live in front of 10,000 people, but um, are, I, we are planning to implement or integrate 3D scanning into part of our product ingest uh, process, right? Yes. Are we planning to, yeah. are we planning to like, publish an STL file on the lab's page so people could evaluate the ergonomics for themselves? That would be sick. We will eventually get there, yes. Luke's cringing. He's so unhappy right I now. I know he's cringing. <laughs> well, it's just a download. It's just a file download, Luke. I'm, I'm sure your team can figure it out. That's not... Linus-led yeah. development. Let's go. Linus-led development is a terrible well, idea. All right. Thanks, Gary. Yeah, j just ask Luke uh, about embedded video also. So, you know. Sick. <laughs> all right. Talk to you later. Okay. Take care. All right, cool. So that's Gary, head of labs. Uh, so you heard it here first, um, 30 days, so soon. Is what, that's the, that's the, the filtered by management version of that. Yeah, very, very excited for that. Um, I don't even know, what, what would we even use for the scans? Because I think we've got that like handheld scanner coming, but if it's something as small as a mouse, I see no reason why we couldn't use the... Um, oh, Bloody hell! I forgot the name of the I forgot the name of the company. I'm sure someone internally will tell. Yeah, CT scanner, um, the Luma Luma field. Uh, I see no reason why we couldn't use the Luma field for something like that. Oh man, that would be that would be sick. Uh, Elijah says I'll model it in Blender by hand every time. No scanner needed. Yeah, you're gonna. Dude, I thought. Anyway, Dan, uh, want to hit me with one more merch message? Uh, yeah, sure. Did you have any more follow up uh, nightmares about the Beat Saber identification? No, I just I hate it. Okay, cool. Thanks, I hate it. You're um, welcome. I, I actually would have been happier not knowing that. It makes perfect sense, obviously, the way that we... I had to read it? I, I mean, I could tell what member of my family was walking up the stairs, you know, just by listening to them, and I'm I'm a, just a monkey brain, right? Like uh, I can usually tell who's walking up to the WAN set just by hearing how they walk. Yeah, yeah. So, so none of this should be... it was a matter be, of time. None but. of this should be that surprising, but... Damn, technology. You're cool, but, like, also like, buzz off sometimes, you yeah. know? Yeah. Yeah. All yeah. right, cool. What's next? I had a bad day as an IT tech. Security IT told me to connect an infected PC to the hospital work LAN and log in with admin credentials to investigate. Felt sick the whole time. How would you handle such a ludicrous ask? Say no. Um, hmm. um, Bring them substantial information on why this is a bad idea and propose an alternative solution that you have also laid out thoroughly of how you can get the results that they want in an easier and safer way. Yeah, that's such a that's such a novice error that I th I think it was a James Bond film. It was some it was some kind of like spy spy flick of some sort. And the way that the bad guy compromises like the 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 lab or whatever is by getting an infected laptop in and like their like head of IT basically just plugs it into the network and it takes over all the screens and everything and I'm just like uh, that was actually the inspiration for a video we still haven't made all these years later, but I wanted to do IT experts react to tech in movies, uh, kind of like Corridor Crew. Um, now that I've said that out loud, I'm putting pressure on the team to get that going. If you guys have any clever ideas, by the way, uh, hmm, where could they post them? Uh, clever ideas like of movies to watch? Of, of particular scenes. Oh, yeah. One of the opening scenes to the new Tron. Uh, okay, hold on, hold on, hold on, though. Okay, we need a place for people to put things. Where can, where can we do that? What? Swordfish, just the movie. That's I, a I fun could, movie. I could come up with an entire okay, script Dan's going to get don't a link really for you guys. To, to what? Was it Skyfall? Was that the one? Um, okay, people are saying Skyfall for the one that I was talking about. Uh, anyway, yeah, so we need, we need to get... We need to get some scenes together. I'd love to have like Wendell come on and be oh, a guest yeah. host for something like that. That'd be awesome. Um, it maybe, oh man, if we could get it together in time, maybe we could shoot it at Computex and we could get some some fun. Oh, of course, we can get it together. Get some time. fun guests. Well, I don't know. I mean, I had, came up with the idea when Skyfall was in theaters, uh, so that should give you some idea. I can easily get a list of scenes for you by like the end of the weekend. Uh, release that was in Skyfall came out in twenty twelve. 
Okay, it wasn't when it was in theaters then. It was at some point. If if it was Skyfall, I actually don't remember exactly which movie it was. I was just going based on uh, when people. When your Linux ISO collector got it. People talking about that. Oh, now he knows what movie it was from. No, I, I don't know. I'm taking Floatplane Chat's word for it, you guys. This is this is all I have to go on. It's it's you guys who are telling me what movie it's from. All right. Yeah, we'll we'll get this going. So Dan, Dan, you're on that, right? I uh, sure. He's going to post a link in chat of some sort. That forum? LTT forum? Is that doable? Uh, I guess so, yeah. Yeah. Dan. Cool. He's a cool guy. <laughs> Look at him go. Look at his <laughs> fingers tight. Uh, all right. You, you know I don't listen to you when you're talking. Why don't we jump right into our next topic? Uh, Luke, have you seen <laughs> this Kickstarter? Huh? Have you seen this Kickstarter? Probably not. Oh, no. From, okay, we're going to watch it together. Uh, awesome. Okay, this is the Paint Cam Eve. It is a face recognition mm. and paintball firing security system, supposedly. Uh, where's the, dang it, where's the, where's the video? Oh. Upcoming project. Bloody heck. No, 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 there's a, no, there's a video. There's a video. Okay, hold on. Is the video on interesting engineering? here it is uh what, what am i even looking at here what is this junk i saw a video i think i got it you got it okay well, no how... i don't no i don't okay gosh darn it oh wait hold on hold on well i do i, I have videos from other people oh i got it okay you got it okay we're going to luke's laptop here it is we've got audio do we care about the audio no nah, it doesn't matter okay cool yeah Play. Introducing Paint Cam Eve, an AI-powered robotic security system. I would like, I would like to know. Um, I mean, I'd like to know so many things. Uh, face recognition, animal recognition. Where, where, did, where is the hopper for those paintballs that came yeah, there, out of? There can't be very many. That came out of the. Oh, okay. It didn't quite come out of the cameras. Um, That's it. That's yeah, yeah. That was it. I saw. I saw another video a little while back. Um, can I just say for a moment, no, I'm going to get through the thing first. Slovenian startup Oz IT is seeking funding for a home surveillance system called Paint Cam Eve that uses facial recognition and motion detection to detect and assess potential threats. It can also shoot these threats with UV paint gall, paint balls, or get this tear gas rounds. <laughs> According to Oz IT, same, same class. The yep. system allows for remote monitoring. <laughs> it's it's non-lethal, but can lethal. also operate fully autonomously without internet. After identifying an intruder in a forbidden area, the device will issue a verbal warning followed by a five-second countdown. If the intruder fails to retreat, the device will aim for their chest and start firing. Oz IT claims the Eve system will be able to recognize specific people as well as animals and specific objects. If an unknown person approaches alongside a familiar guest, the system will notify the user seeking further instructions. So I saw a demo somewhere where they had a known person standing in front of the unknown person and it like it didn't fire. Not that that could be faked or doctored at all. So I would like to I would like to ask, and I guess I'm addressing Oz IT directly here. I would like to ask your engineers, leadership, sure. have you ever fired a paintball gun? <laughs> Do you have any idea why we don't use musket rounds anymore? Have you seen how inaccurate they are? If you fire at someone's chest with a paintball round do you have any idea what your liability is going to look like when somebody loses a fucking eye i mean even if this thing worked as well as you think it did even if you with your however many hundreds of dollars you're going to raise on kickstarter managed to create an automated turret the likes of which many much larger teams have tried to create with sometimes catastrophic results even if you did that the round you're firing is so spectacularly stupidly inaccurate that this is a disaster before you even wake up from the weird fucking fever dream that you had and thought 
Oh, that seems like a good idea. I mean, people have already made these. Like, of course they have. Yeah. Wait, didn't uh, didn't hasn't a YouTuber made this? Um, I'm I'm only remembering this now. What's his? I know the channel Boy Boy. I don't remember what the channel where they make the things on is called. Um, maybe I can find it by just looking up Boy Boy. Michael Reeves. I mean, yeah, he's probably done something like that. I did a thing. That's it. Yeah, didn't he make one? I mean, we're working on a water one for my cats to keep them from scratching up my carpets, but that's a whole separate conversation. The point is, hey, thanks for yeah. coming out. Uh, this is a really, really bad idea. Yeah, so it's it's a bad idea uh, because most like this is a this is a creator from Slovenia, so we don't know what the laws are there. Yep. I see a large amount of uh, Americans in the chat talking about how this is definitely illegal and is a federal offense, which is why I'm assuming they're Americans. Um, but like this is yeah, this is a company in Slovenia, but uh, people have done this. I'm gonna show off. Oh yeah, it's on my screen now. I did a thing as a video. I made an illegal home security system where he just straps a paintball gun to a camera on a tripod that like can do things, and it uh it. I think that yeah, they wore T-shirts with someone's face on it, and then had it shoot them for a while. This is not this is not advanced technology. This is like. It's very doable. Um, yes. And you'll get in insane amounts of trouble because most countries that I know of have some form of legal system around, based around like automated home defense. And the way that that's usually set up is because of traps, booby traps and stuff. And there's been cases where people will like rig a shotgun so that if like a barn door is opened, the shotgun will shoot out. And yeah. That's not okay. <laughs> it's actually super dumb and, and super bad. The damage that is inflicted, the the person who ends up being responsible for that is is not uh, the the thing that ends up being responsible for that is not this automated turret. It's you. Yep. And like, uh, yeah, the second this paintball hurts someone or doesn't, and then that person just claims that it hurt them. Yeah, you're screwed. That's a big one. You're the screwed whole, The whole just like people claiming stuff and then I'm it, traumatized now. All of a sudden it's on you to prove that I, I can't open doors without fear anymore. I need therapy for the rest of my life. Yeah. You're going to pay for it. Now you're out millions. Bob Icarus says paintballs can be fairly accurate, but you need a pretty long barrel to actually get the round to spiral. That little camera was like, yeah, Bob, yeah, Bob brought that up. It had a maximum like two inch barrel. There is absolutely. And, and Bob Icarus is right. At a range of, but that's the thing, right? Like at a range of, let's say, 10 meters, 30 feet, I could probably hit an aluminum can pretty consistently. Like I'll miss, but I'll miss by a little bit. Like I could hit a torso, no problem from that distance every time. However, the problem is that uh, A, 30 feet? That's nothing. Presumably this thing is not mounted like at the perimeter of wh wherever you're trying to protect. Like it's, it's like a home security thing. By the time someone is within 30 feet of this thing, if you have it mounted in a traditional security camera location. I think it's supposed to be indoors. Indoors? Oh, well that's, but this, this security camera thing is indoors? It's outdoors? Well, How I, long would its range be? It, it, well, that's my point. That's even more insane. It, is, is you're going you're gonna to have... You're like facial recognition of someone just walking down the street. You're going to have 20 of, the, <laughs> you're gonna have 20 of those feet just in the distance to the ground. Yeah. No, not to mention you're going to have to compensate for drop-off somehow. Okay, hold on a second. This is getting even more complicated. Tear gas in your house? Yeah, okay, fair enough. Yeah, Maybe and, then that not... and then that barrel. <laughs> that barrel further complicates it. This thing is not going to be accurate. It has absolutely no hope whatsoever of being accurate <laughs> at all. I assumed this was just indoors. It being outdoors makes it significantly more hilarious. It, it, I mean, there's, there's some amount of like, you know, accuracy and volume where if it's able to shoot just like a huge amount yeah, of stuff. How big's the hopper on that thing? Uh, yeah, what, six I rounds? I didn't see one at all, so no. yeah, I don't know. But um, if they have like, maybe, maybe it gets fed through something that's like on the other side of the wall or something. Yeti no Wrangler idea. says porch pirates maybe, but yeah, but if it gives them a five second warning, I could be off and on your porch in five seconds. And the first porch pirate that gets shot by that is just going to tell everyone else they know and everyone else is going to go get shot and then they're going to sue the heck out of you. Like 
That'll be the new scam. Yeah. Getting shot by these things so you can sue the owners. Um, in probably, I'm assuming, most countries. We don't know about all of them. Maybe in Slovenia, having automated defenses for your home is totally fine. Calabarn says, no um, actually, I have a 98 Custom where the barrel curves up. It's pretty accurate at long range. Does not have to be a long barrel. Yeah, but your 98 Custom barrel is like four to five times the length of this barrel. <laughs> that's, this little tiny security camera barrel is very small. Yeah, that's that's part of the problem. So many problems. Uh, why don't we jump into our next topic, which is sad and happy? Remember the spiffing Brit tea PC that had yeah. that teapot pouring as part of the water loop? Yeah. Well, um, we have an update on it. Uh, f- unfortunately, as we feared, it did indeed break in transit. And as we feared, the tea in the loop did indeed start supporting life. Okay, so here's a question right yes. off the hop. It broke in transit? When did we send this? I don't know, a thousand years ago? Yeah, what... Well, he hasn't been using it, but hold on. The story the story continues. So this is this is the spiffing Brit PC. What was up with my hair that day? I had, you were on a I have no idea bit what of I'm a tear. This was only at. a year ago. Is this that YouTube thing where it yes. was like essentially two years ago? This was a year and a half ago. Yeah. Um, man, look at this. This is awful. Anyway, the point is here's the finished PC. Did we ever actually Yeah, there we go. We did an actual montage so you could check out the system. Absolutely incredible. Alex outdid himself. I uh, got that got that teapot got that teapot action. Unfortunately, the system has not been in action uh, finding loopholes and exploits on the perfectly balanced YouTube platform. Yeah. According to Overclockers UK, who repaired the PC, the GPU moved laterally in transit, causing the riser cable to essentially split in half. Uh, I'm only going to check out this close up here because you guys should definitely go check out out overclockers Oof. uk's video they did a whole video on this i've seen this before uh i wish it surprised me but yep this is the thing that happens you can see it it broke so that and would explain why it wasn't working normally you want to ship those separately but water cooled in yeah gets a little harder not always an option yeah um the repair team didn't have an identical replacement so they used a gen 4 fantex riser cable with an adapter bracket the water block radiator and loop, despite being gross, <laughs> were successfully cleaned, though the pipe through the teapot was apparently too disgusting and had to be replaced. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. Uh, oh, I think they're saying the GPU block was successfully cleaned. The CPU block apparently turned out to be restricting the flow rate and had to be replaced, as well as the D5 pump. Interesting. Are they saying that it was because of the growth or because of... It must be. A D5s are... It was just very restrictive. Uh, no, the block. Um, anyway, I'm surprised they weren't able to clean the D5 as well. Anyway... But he, well, they said as well as the D5 pump, right? Interesting. Meaning that had the same problem. Anyway, the T has apparently been replaced with a combination of EK cryofuel that is then dyed to resemble T and everything else seems to have arrived in working order. Uh, they apparently added their own branded mug to the build. Okay, that's the last thing that I am going to check out. I want to see. I want to see how they integrated their stuff into into our original build here. Here, here it is. Uh, so here's their footage. So they've added a Barrow CPU block, and where's their where's their mug? Where's your mug at, boys? I honestly, I looked for it. I Show find. me your mug. I found no, the- not that mug. <laughs> Get it? I, it face. The Yorkshire tea box. I don't think was originally there. I believe it was actually. Oh. That would have been an Alex innovation. I don't see the mug. Yeah, I, I couldn't see it. Well, anyway, great job. Thanks for getting that fixed up. Why do we ever build computers for creators? They always get broken in transit. Uh, and the funny thing is, like, we even, uh, we man, we went out of T-box our way. T-Box was there, okay. We, we, we create things. We, like, we, couriers are just determined to destroy things. You know what? It, I think people don't appreciate what transit does to things. There's a reason that PC companies are like, yeah, you know what? We only build computers in America for Americans because the longer something goes, the greater the chance that it will essentially vibrate itself into pieces. Hmm. Um, Check this out. Um, Hmm. Here, hold on. I'm just trying to find this thing. Here we go. Uh, The, no, where is it? Dang it. There's this new, it's either new or it's, uh, it was recently in the news cycle. Um, uh, it's, it's a hard drive destroyer 
data sanitizer thingamajig that works solely on vibration. What's the company called? No, no, that's not it. I, bl I bloody well hate it. When, here we go. Garner. There we go. Here it is. Okay, this is a promotional product, so I have no problem showing this video in its entire... Or it's a promotional video for a product. Realistically, they're not going to get mad at us. It's called the Disc Mantler. Patent pending. From Garner. You put the hard drive in. Check this out. It shakes it. That's right, friends. See you later. That's some vigorous shaking. Everything is disassembled. It apparently does it in just a couple of minutes or something like that. And I think people underestimate what sitting on a truck or in the cargo hold of an airplane or being anywhere, being on it, being on a I, ship with those, with those diesel engines going under it. I think they underestimate what these conditions do to a product. Heat cycling, increasing, decreasing, shaking and vibrating. Um, I think I've told this story before, but I used to have a very reliable client when I used to do like IT stuff on the side, um, who was a trucker who was actually on like some trucking TV show at some point or whatever, but he would often have his laptop running on his passenger seat and it would just shake itself to death because they were all hard drives back then. Yeah. And he would come back to me, you know, every, however long and, uh, another hard drive's dead. He doesn't need a better laptop. He uses it for like almost nothing, but he just needed a new drive. And I would have, I had like his favorite desktop background, which was like him standing next to his motorbike or whatever. So I would like set it back up exactly how he liked it with the programs that he liked. I didn't have an exact ISO because like obviously some things would change, whatever. Um, and, and I'll just rebuild it for him every time. And then SSDs became like a thing. And I was like, well, man, I like hate to say it, but this is the last time I'm going to do this for you. And he's like, why? I was like, I got you a new thing. I'm not going to bother explaining it, but it's not going to die anymore. And he was like, oh, okay, cool. And then, yeah, never heard from him again. <laughs> it is what it is. Um, apparently, uh, yeah, it's apparently Doc. I was sorry. This is totally unrelated. Apparently Doc Martens, you know, like the shoes is really struggling right now. And, uh, a big part of the problem might be that they have kind of qualityed themselves into uh, financial trouble because their stuff just like lasts for a really long time. Yeah. Um, SSDs, because of the growth in capacity in performance initially, and in, then especially capacity now, I think have kind of saved themselves from that. But I hate to I hate to be this guy. Oh, oh this is a really scary thing to say, but I feel like we've reached the point now where People aren't going to need to upgrade their SSDs that much anymore. Like one terabyte has been kind of the magic sweet spot for what is definitely good enough for a boot drive for a long time. And I might buy some more storage, but that was not the way it worked before. I was essentially replacing my drive for a long time as we made our way through 60 gigs, 120 gigs, 256. Um, and yeah, sure, you could run your OS on it, but for convenience, people were getting a new system, they were just getting a new SSD that was a much greater capacity. I feel like we've reached the point now where it's just not really necessary anymore. And unless you are, you know, pull an Apple and lock the SSD to the system, yeah. you're going to be stuck with people just wanting to carry their drives forward. Yeah. Uh, uh, speaking of upgrading and building quality products that don't need to be replaced very often. LTDstore.com. We've actually got a couple new products. If you guys uh, were looking for an excuse to send a merch message, we've got our phase. These look sick. Pullover hoodie and uh, zip up hoodie and t shirt. These are genuinely super cool. So, this design started off inspired by. Um, shoot, it was something. Oh, yeah. It started off inspired by like a VHS. Yeah. Low fidelity kind of thing that Lloyd pitched me. And I was like, mm, yeah, I see where you're going, but mm, yeah, no. But you know what? Take this part that really reminds me of these, um, like those image tests. And let's just lean into that. And he came up with this design that I think is so flipping awesome. So these are, these are kind of like, um, Res like inspired by resolution test patterns. We've got like a little, you know, color block there just to add a nice little splash of color to the design. Um, 
I don't know what the 23 is anymore. It doesn't matter. The point is we've got a few different colorways and you guys can check that out. We've also got a pullover hoodie and a zip up hoodie in the design. So there you go. I think it looks great. And of course it's your typical LTT quality. Oh, look at that. We've got Navy hoodies now. Noise, a noise. Test shirt, please ignore. That's a that's a that's a pretty funny name for it. Sorry, what, what's what's that, Luke? Test shirt, please ignore. Where? Uh, Corey is the name in in chat. Said you should call it test shirt, please oh. ignore. Yes. Pretty funny. Um, Dan, twenty three. Yeah, but that doesn't mean anything. Dan, why does your thing say "when after dark"? Are are we, are we out of topic time already? No, no. Basically, you can just go whenever now. Uh, oh. I know that uh, Luke may wanted to uh, oh. step out. So. Okay, no, I'm still good. Yeah, as long as I'm home by like nine. I think. Oh, right. okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, Watcher leaves YouTube. I have to confess, as someone who doesn't watch that much YouTube, I hadn't watchered them before. Ah. But it's a really interesting business move and something that I thought you know Luke might have some thoughts to share. Uh, Watcher Entertainment, a media company founded four years ago by three former BuzzFeed creators, has officially announced they are leaving YouTube and beginning their own ad-free subscription streaming service, WatcherTV.com. According to the founders, they have found themselves increasingly split between creating the content that their fans want and creating the content that appeals to advertisers and to YouTube's algorithm. Further, they've been dealing with a tension between the costs necessary to maintain television-like artistic standards and the financial model that is required to thrive on YouTube. Their hope is that switching to their own streaming service will allow them to build a more sustainable business and rely less on advertisers. The site went live today. It's currently priced at $6 a month or $60 a year, and they're offering 30% off the first year. I assume that might be a typo here. For anyone who subscribes before May 31st, as well as the opportunity to vote on which previously canceled Watcher series should be revived. This is an interesting move. Mm -hmm. I think they're doomed. Yeah, me too. I think I said, I think it was literally last WAN show where I gave my like five websites statement, uh, which is I, 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 my theory on this, I'll try to keep it short, is that roughly everyone has roughly five websites each that they go to. It's not the same five websites for everybody, but most people have like a few websites that they go to and pretty much nothing else. And if you leave that sphere for people, you're, gone and you can you can sort of exist in both like you can have a foot outside like i suspect you know the vast majority of the line of tech tips audience doesn't go to full plane all the time the full plane subscribers do sure but we're on yeah. youtube so our visibility doesn't go away people still know that we exist but by completely leaving the the youtubes the reddits the whatever things like that facebook's of, of the facebook's world. of the world yeah. by leaving those entirely your discoverability goes away. Now they are planning to upload, I think they were saying like the first few videos of a given series on YouTube, but then the idea I guess is they're paywalling the rest of it. So kind of like if uh, if Netflix just uploaded the first episode of right. every series to YouTube. That's a better that's a better idea than I, I thought it was, but I still think that this is it, going to be an incredible challenge. I mean, we've um, we struggle with all the same things. You know, how do we balance increasing yeah, production values? Tough. How do we balance? And I, I do think that it's a little bit um, misleading to I mean, whether it's our notes or their feelings or whatever. I, I do feel that it's not it's not quite right to say that you have to fight between or, or you're torn between what the algorithm wants and what the audience wants because the algorithm and the audience are one and the same ish because the algorithmic audience is the the broader audience whereas i think that if you were to say if i were to say my audience right who would i be thinking of would i be thinking of a random flyby who happens to come across one of our videos one time gets engaged with it, watches that video, and then never watches another LTT video? No, I, would, I wouldn't think of that person as my audience. I would think of that person as my algorithmic, I don't know, 
person that YouTube managed to serve this thing to, right? Like they're not my audience. When I think of my audience, I think of the WAN show viewers. I think of the people who are actually enabling notifications on their phone and, and clicking on them when they come up, which by the way is very small in case you guys were curious. I wanted to make a video about that for a while. I even came up with the title, you won't click this notification. Um, because they won't. It's like, it's like a fraction of a percent or something like that. It's like absolutely minuscule. Um, anyway, like, so there's different ways to define my audience. And so in that sense, if I were to talk about the differences between what the algorithm wants and what my audience wants, it makes sense. And I think that's what they're talking about. But the danger of catering to this one, catering to my audience, catering to you guys with the mainline content versus catering to you guys with the WAN show on a weekly basis where we really get to sit down and hang out. Uh, catering to you guys with behind the scenes on float plane where we will pull silly pranks on each other and you can kind of see the real personalities come out. We'll get, we'll get deeper into, uh, Tanner did a really cool video doing a deeper dive on that North Korean Wii U clone thing. Um, that's the kind of stuff that we want to make and and we understand that you guys want to see, but we can't infect the mainline content with that because that's our discovery funnel, right? We need that algorithmic audience. And if you're putting out, if you're, if you're casting fewer nets out into that sea of potential audience members, that audience, that core audience is going to decay. And, you know, I've seen every reason under the sun for someone to cite that they're not going to watch anymore. Um, I, had some, <laughs> I, I had someone uh, tell me how disappointed they were that um, we built such a cheapskate computer for that person who begged for one and, um, and that it, it really showed how not generous we were. It was hilarious because it came literally the day after we raised $100,000 for sick kids, <laughs> right? <laughs> a video they clearly didn't watch. <laughs> Right. Uh, imagine, so cool, imagine for a second if it had absolutely nothing to do with that and had everything to do with what I said, which is that we wanted it to be something good enough to like really be a gaming PC worth going and getting, but not so good that they were going to get like murdered on the way home. That was it. That that was the re imagine a whole skit. Imagine Elijah gets stabbed in the back. I think. Imagine for a second if the reason was just not what that I told Elijah you. Got stabbed. That's not the great part. Sorry, the skit was great. Yeah. Um, <sighs> Sorry, where was I? Where was I going with this? Right. I, I've been given every reason under the sun for someone to stop watching anymore. But the reality of it is most of the time it's that you've changed. You've moved on. I've probably changed too, but I suspect I haven't changed as much as you have in terms of the product that we're trying to upload. We're, we're always trying to do things a little bit differently. We're trying to do them a little bit better, but the cold hard truth is what's probably happened, and this is particularly understandable lately with tech, at least in the, you know, on the gaming, PC gaming side, um, the traditional PC gaming side getting, you know, kind of stagnant compared to what we're used to, kind of, kind of boring compared to what we're used to, right? Um, that's probably the, the most honest reason that people have given me for, for, for not watching anymore. Man, if I had a dollar for every time someone said they're not watching anymore because we're constantly making <laughs> jokes and the juvenile humor, I'm sitting here going like... We never did that in 2012. Okay, buddy. Never. Yeah, that's, that's a new thing. That's a new thing. <laughs> if anything, it's probably gotten less, to, to be completely honest. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe that's it. Maybe it's more jarring now. Maybe. I don't know. There's still a fair bit I'd, of it. I doubt it. Yeah. yeah. There's still a fair bit of it. So I've done some poking around while we've been sitting yep. here. Um, um, but anyway, okay. So hold on. Let okay. me finish. Let me finish really right. quick. I, I'm sorry. Um, so sorry, by Jim. not, by not casting out nets to the algorithmic audience, right? The broader audience, you aren't replenishing the core audience and that attrition is unavoidable. You can't watch the same TV show forever. Yeah. Think about it. You can't play the same video game forever one person in the audience is like i've played starcraft since i was born and we're, we're not game. mostly we're not mostly wired like that yeah. and so i i think that while this is something that could be very successful uh in the short term they could convert a significant amount of their current core audience over to this paid platform uh, I, I worry. I mean, it's not like this isn't the kind of thing that we've dabbled in in the past. We were one of the, 
we were, as far as I can tell, the only relevant creator on Vessel.com. We built Floatplane. Like sweat, blood, and tears built Floatplane in an effort to to, to create that sustainability. Most of the creators on Vessel.com stopped kind of doing the early access thing, all this kind of stuff. We weren't the only relevant creator on the platform. We were the only relevant creator to Vessel in terms of revenue. Yeah. Sorry, I should clarify. Um, anyway, so I, I've done some looking around. Someone in the chat pointed out Dimension or sorry, not Dimension. Well, Dimension 20 is one of their products, but um, Dropout.tv, which I think was a really, really good call out of a channel that has done something similar. As far as my understanding goes, actually, I'm not even going to go there because I don't even know, but um, they do a really good job. They still get into the brain space on the main channels. They do stuff with shorts, um, and I, yep. I think they might still release full videos here or there. Um, every now and again, but it's a funnel into dropout TV for the most part. And as far as my understanding goes, they're very successful with this. They also have a very large amount of different shows and shows with like very diehard dedicated audiences, which is exactly what you would need in order to uh, do this. Uh, Murik says dropout uses Vimeo as their, their backbone provider. Yes. Um, and I think that's a good idea. I think that's how they should do that. If they wanted to do this approach where it's one creator, one website, they want the thing. They should just use another service like Vimeo. Vimeo is a great solution there um, and and run it that way. Um, yeah, Dropout has a ton of different series and they've been doing this for a long time. They're very well set up. Now, uh, looking into it as well, it's like, okay, what external monetization does Watcher have? So first thing you look for is there are more links on their YouTube channel yep. and you can see Patreon. So, okay, let's go to their Patreon. If I can click things. Well, they've converted 1,200 members, which is very good conversion. Very respectable. They're doing a great job. They've got what looks like well-fleshed out good tiers. We could maybe learn something from that. Um, <laughs> they do, you know, they've got a seven. This is all Canadian dollars, so the 750 is probably five bucks. Mm -hmm. Looking at a, some form of standardization. It's probably five USD, 10 USD. Six, maybe. I don't know. Maybe something like six, that. something yeah. around that. I don't know exactly. Um, but they've they've got a good pricing range. They even have the like whale big, big crazy one yep um and they seem to be posting actively so they 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 can convert people to outside platforms they can yep. show that they have a very strong outside platform presence um one thing that they might unfortunately find is that patreon is one of those websites that a lot of people go to it might be harder to convert to a external platform non-patreon funding website um i have looked into watchers website as well watcher.tv and this is also built with vimeo um as the video playing back end someone pointed out that dropout was done that way this one is also done that way i don't remember how i determined that i think it was this video uh you can pretty easily tell this is the vimeo player but another fun yeah. uh thing to do is like let's just copy this url um and go to builtwith.com and you just paste in the url and you can see like all the things that they're using. And if you scroll down a little bit to audio and video media, you can see Vimeo. Um, so yeah, they're using Vimeo, which seems like uh, probably a good idea for what they're doing. So they're doing a lot of things well from uh, my judgment. I don't know what that matters, but um, I don't know. I wish them the best. I hope they do the thing that Dropout TV is doing where they still sprinkle out content quite healthily and really start trying to grasp onto things like shorts mm -hmm. where they can try to convert people. Look, there's this really tasty little nibble from yep. this video. You need to go over to this other site to watch it. Um, yeah. Someone in, someone in chat said rooster teeth did it for a while, but then it just slowly went into obscurity. That's the risk. That's why this is terrifying. Yep. Um, rooster teeth is not the only example that that's happened to. Um, it's just a really big name. Uh, but yeah, this is this is scary, but I wish them the best. I hope it goes well. Yeah. I don't know, man. It's uh it's tough. And once you've um, you know, Did once, I say 1200? Yeah, I meant 12,000, sorry. Yeah, once you've once you've got an audience, it's um you know, it's something, but it's it's small. Like we've we've got 35,000 subscribers on Floatplane. We are we are one of the top Patreons, except we're not on Patreon. Yeah, um, we've been very very successful at it, 
And still, in the grand scheme of things, guys, the, the revenue that we can generate on an audience that small, even directly as paying customers, it, it pales in comparison to the costs associated with hosting video. Hosting video through Vimeo is not cheap. Um, and it pales in comparison to you know, you know, what you can generate more broadly through ads and sponsorships and, and all of those things on, on a platform like YouTube. I do, yeah, I do. I, I worry. I worry about them, that's all. I mean, these aren't people that I know personally or anything like that, but I, I generally think the creator economy is pretty cool. I think of other creators as my, my fellow creators. These are people who have gone through a lot of the same struggles, a lot of the same challenges that we have, and I, I want nothing but the best for them. Um, but I, I, I'm, a, I fear, I fear for these kinds of moves. They can be, and, and I'm sure, I'm sure they feel it too, right? It, it can be scary because once you've, once you've left, it's not that easy to just come back. Mm -hmm. What else we got today? Spiffing Brent, Jim Keller. We talked about the, uh, Ooh, I didn't mention during that merch update that all of those, uh, the labs, uh, t-shirt pullover and zip up are print to order. So, uh, they, the shipping will be delayed. Whoops. Uh, okay. This was actually from like last week or week before. I don't remember when it was, but HP has been sued for their alleged printer ink monopoly. Again, HP has used printer firmware updates to create a monopoly, alleges the newest class action lawsuit brought against the company for their dynamic security feature. The lawsuit, filed in Illinois, alleges that firmware updates in late 2022 to early 2023 blocked HP printers from using non-HP ink cartridges, forcing owners to buy first-party ink and lose the value of any non-HP branded cartridges that they already had. This isn't the first time that HP has faced a lawsuit over this practice. Since Dynamic Security was introduced in 2016, HP has settled a California class action for $1.5 million in 2019, admitting no wrongdoing, but a agreeing to prohibit use of the firmware. They are facing a separate California lawsuit seeking an injunction against the practice. They have agreed to pay about 50 Australian dollars to affected Australians in 2018, admitting the company likely breached consumer law and they were ordered to label printer packaging to reflect the first party implementation. They were fined 10 million euros by the Italian government in 2020 in order to modify sales packages of printers. And they agreed to settle a complaint pertaining to customers in Belgium, Italy, Spain, and Portugal for $1.35 million, admitting no wrong doing and they settled a Clinton Canadian class action in 2019 for a maximum of 700,000 CAD denying they did anything wrong. Our discussion question is how many times do we have to prove that what HP is doing is not okay in order for this to stop? I don't think there's a limit to be completely honest. I think this is just how it goes. I think they're 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 kind of like uh, limit testing to see what they will and won't get sued for, and they can do it as many times as they want. This is like we've we've talked about this before about like there's so much money in maintaining your monopoly and building yeah, customers that it's worth just getting sued over and over and over again because you're never going to get sued hard enough because everything's mostly just a slap on the wrist. So who's going to be the one that finally? goes after them. I mean, the U S has kind of woken up recently, but I feel like they've got their hands full with, uh, Apple right now. Oh, Hey, should we talk about Boston Dynamics's new, uh, new robot? One day, one day after they announced that Atlas is no more, they announced a new all electric humanoid robot also named Atlas. Um, you want to watch the video? Yeah, I mean, I've watched it now, obviously, but it's worth watching again. I love how they made it stand up. It's just... Dude, seriously, this <laughs> legitimately reminds me of iRobot. Like, it, 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 looks more, it looks more fake than it does real. Yeah. It looks, like, I, it looks like a game. It looks like a character out of a Portal game or something like it. I've always had kind of a theory that like the the people and the contracts that are that are working with Boston Dynamics they they kind of want their videos to appear sort of terrifying. Um, I don't know. They are masters, masters at viral marketing. I mean, they've got four million views on this video. Yeah, 
And the more terrifying they make it, the more people are going to share. Oh, have you seen this? It's crazy. It's spooky, man. The robots are going to take over. This looks super cool, dude. I mean, yeah, it makes sense, right? Like, why do your limbs have to only bend the way that human limbs do? They might as well just, like, bend in in any way that you want, but, like, but still be human-shaped so that you can take advantage of how the world is kind of made for humans. Yeah. What kind of jobs are these going to do? Nice. I am amazed at how, and obviously we can't, we can't quite tell, um, but I am amazed at how apparently human-like the form factor is I, I i i don't know i mean obviously i'm not i'm not uh an expert when it comes to um the is robotic it much design more human-like than atlas was atlas was pretty bulky atlas was like a human with a gigantic hey, backpack you know some people are pretty bulky but this is atlas was very like barrel chested yeah i guess the the legs on atlas were kind of like naturally curved out so that wasn't as... At Atlas was hydraulic, right? This is yeah. electric? Yeah. Yeah, but that doesn't change appearance much. Uh, it might be the extra overhead of all the cables and pumps and things, maybe. Mm. This is wild, dude. It's nuts. I just keep looking at this going, like, I, I thought we were... A, like, a, I'm, I'm obviously not an expert when it comes to robotics, right? Like, it's not what I do. But I thought we were a lot more years away from something that was this clean and this compact. Mm -hmm. that's what's really blowing me away about this like how how does that have enough battery power to operate yeah. on board it yeah like where even is it probably in the chest somewhere but still that's wild yeah right yeah. Why, why wouldn't you just put it everywhere yeah i mean maybe yeah well more wiring is actually it, it yeah. adds complication i mean it yeah. help, might help with weight distribution but no it, idea there's definitely going to be trade-offs there Wireless charging in the feet, yeah, that that. You might sure. also not have one battery that powers the whole thing. Like those, those like, uh, it's like quad where where you would normally have quad muscles are pretty bulky. There might be batteries like for the legs in that area. Not sure. Or that's just all infrastructure for the knees. That's probably what it is. Man, I have no idea. I don't know. Yeah, figure robots. We, I'm pretty sure we've watched that figure AI video on on WAN, didn't we? Where it like hands the person the apple and stuff. Did we not watch that? I can't remember. Yeah. Oh. We did on WAN? We did? I don't remember. <laughs> Sorry. Have you seen... Oh, I literally closed it right as you Wow, looked. nice. Um, uh, while he looks that up, Keanu Reeves is apparently going to be the voice of Shadow the Hedgehog in the upcoming Sonic 3 movie. Nice. Um... The plot of the movie reportedly involves Dr. Robotnik getting his groove back after the events of Sonic 2. So, yeah, it could be, could be interesting. Um, cool. Okay, you ready? <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. Oh, it's an ad. Nice. Cool, a backpack. It's not a backpack. Okay. Is this it? Yeah, have you seen this? Do you recognize this? No. Okay, so maybe we haven't then. Maybe Dan and I were just talking about it. Sorry, I you, thought this was the one that you watched on WAN. You kind of need audio. Can we get that figured out? Uh, yeah, I, I'm sure I can live without it. He's he's telling it to do something. It's going to do something. That's uh, fine, it's, I get it. It's definitely better with audio. Oh, wow. Because he does reasoning and stuff, like, through audio. So, like, he's asking him to tell him, like, why he's doing different things and in what order while he's doing a different thing actively with his hands. That's pretty cool. Where should all the dishes go and stuff like that, I think yeah. is... Yeah. While he's putting the garbage away. So he's like doing a task mm. while talking about a different task. Alrighty. And the world's going to be wild. And then he tells him like, based on, based on what you see in front of you, where do you think the cup and the plate should go? And then he says something along the lines of like, I think they should go in the drying rack. And then he tells him to actually like do it. So he has it, he has it reason it out first. And then I don't think he says, like, put them in the drying rack. I think he says, like, okay, do that or whatever. Or like, put them away or something. Yeah. Huh. He looks a lot more useful than my kids. <laughs> huh. All right. Well, good luck, humans. Um, yeah. 
YouTube is warning of another ad blocking crackdown. This week, they published a memo warning that third party apps that violate YouTube's terms of service, specifically YouTube viewing clients that block ads,、mm. um, are going to be experiencing a crackdown. YouTube was vague about how exactly it would act against these apps, beyond saying that app users may encounter issues like buffering, error messages, and videos failing to load. YouTube emphasized the importance of ads in supporting creators and their content.、Uh, the Chrome Store, meanwhile, still offers several ad blocking third party YouTube apps. So, I guess the question here is what is YouTube's strategy here exactly? Trying to get less people to use the platform without watching ads? Yeah, but like, if, you, if you're not a premium subscriber, if you're not a member of anyone's channel, it's pretty brutal. And you block ads. Oh, I thought you were going to say the amount of ads on YouTube is pretty brutal. Oh, no. I was going to agree with that. So, if you, if you don't watch the ads, anyways,、yep. because you're blocking them、yep. and you're not doing any other method of giving them money for using the platform, why would they care? Yeah, I think it's, a, it's pretty interesting、uh, seeing people who do block ads on the platform saying, well, I'm just going to boycott YouTube. And,、um, so what? and I, I think they don't really fully understand that they are.、Um, they are It's, it's kind of like being vegan and saying you're going to boycott McDonald's. It's like, so? I think you already were. Yeah, who cares? Their fries、um, are cooked. You're not, you're not a customer.、Um, you, are, you are, from a monetary standpoint to YouTube, you are not just worthless. You are actually vampiric. You are parasitic.、Um, they don't care at all.、Yeah. And so it's been, it's been interesting to see some of the discourse around this on both sides, right? Like, I personally see this as a win, but not for the reason you think. Because, I mean, as a tech creator who's found ways to monetize our content, in spite of the fact that probably a disproportionate Um, percentage of our audience does engage in ad blocking.、Uh, realistically, you know, okay, they, they crack down on ad blocking, they don't crack down on ad blocking. It probably, it's not an existential、it's、question. It's going to change very little for us. It changes us. almost nothing to me.、Yeah. Um, but the reason I see this as a win is because in the earlier days of third party YouTube. Apps,、uh, Google was very,、um, very antagonistic. Like, remember that Windows Mobile didn't have a YouTube app because Google wouldn't make one, and the third party ones were constantly being hampered.、Uh, there was one third party one in particular, I forget what it's called, but basically,、um, th- we weren't there, there wasn't you had to use a browser on Windows, on Windows Phone, which kind of sucked. And while YouTube is obviously taking a stance against third party apps that engage in ad blocking here, what they aren't doing, and the win that I see here, is they are backing down. What they aren't doing is going after the third party apps for existing. They are backing down on the changes to the UI that people might be enjoying through these third party apps and basically just going, okay, look, truce. But don't block the ads.、Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's probably about the best offer we're going to get from them because the negotiating power of the users of these apps that block ads is zero. It's, it's, it's less than zero. And there's, like, there's, there's some stuff you can argue about. Like, if those users are sharing that content or talking about the platform in general, it becomes more in the like, mind space of others and stuff. But the、sure. value of that is like, so incredibly low. And YouTube already has, oh, I don't know, roughly the entire planet as its user base. So I don't think they care. Yeah. So this is going to be.、Uh... I think this war is only going to escalate. And I think, don't quote me on this, but my understanding is that Google's tools for detecting ad blocking are much more sophisticated than what they have necessarily deployed. I think they are making a conscious decision about how aggressive or not aggressive to be towards ad blocking. And yes, Ad blocking services are evolving, but I suspect that they are evolving at a pace that they won't necessarily be able to, or I suspect the pace at which they're evolving 
is reactionary and Google is capable of laying the hammer down in a much more significant way. I think in a lot of these like cat and mouse type of games, you don't necessarily put all your cards on the table, right? So like, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if you're right. Yeah, so uh, good luck. Good luck, everybody. What I hope is that that's where we settle, where we can have nice things. We can have third-party apps that don't shove shorts down your throat or that, um, yeah. or that you know, don't fill your... Um, don't fill your space with unnecessary promotion of other videos or that allow you to get straight to the comments or, you know, whatever the things are that bother you about the official YouTube app. I hope we can have nice things and I hope that the third party apps figure out this is the best deal you're going to get. Take it now or take it later, I guess, but you will ultimately probably end up taking it. Mm -hmm. um, Stick boy over on float plane says if premium wasn't 14 something dollars maybe i would consider it i would never advocate for finding a group of friends and buying youtube a youtube premium family plan oh. of course not i would never advocate for that yeah i mean i can see why some people might do it right because it would significantly lower the cost of the YouTube premium subscription for all the people while still contributing at least something to the cost of running the platform, not to mention to the creators that you enjoy, but I would never advocate for that. And like, it's not like it would be that hard either. It's actually like the systems are just there, right? I think you just send email invites. Oh, this is interesting. Chroma Chan says, I got nabbed for that. They IP checked me, really? Because I'm pretty sure... No, I have people on my, in, my fa in my Google family that are not at the same address. Have they changed the TOS on that? Ooh, interesting. People are saying, me too. <gasps> All right, well... Um, that shows Points you what I Luke. know. No, I got bumped out. I was in it for a while, and then I got removed from oh. the Sebastian YouTube family. Yeah, sorry, brother. Mm-hmm. Hey, technically, I think Steam is up to six, so... Uh, nice. <laughs> I'm back in. <laughs> we'll see. I mean, you can, only, uh, you can only join and rejoin them. By the way, have we talked about the new Steam family, family sharing thing? Or I, I forget what they're calling. Steam yeah. families. I don't know if there's been an update, but we did talk about it originally, yeah. Oh, we did. Okay. Yeah. Well, I've been using it, and it's super cool. That's all I have to say about that. Nice. Yeah, I absolutely love it. Um... There's like parental controls now. The sharing works great. Uh, something I wasn't sure about because it says that you can only, while I can play a game, while someone else plays a game, a different game from my library. And I didn't, uh, I wasn't sure if it would be possible for it to pool licenses together and allow two oh. people to play at once, right? Okay, so if any two people on your family network have a game then any two people could play that game simultaneously yeah that's pretty sick so actually. you can pool I didn't licenses expect that would work either that's really cool super cool that's very cool so as long as you know let's say yvonne and i own a license of a game two of our kids could play it together as long as yvonne and i are each playing oh, completely different games yeah I, I, so cool you and yvonne is like two separate entities in this case yeah so if, you, if you both owned a license to a game then Two kids could also yeah. play it if you weren't playing it. Yeah, so yeah. cool. Yeah, that's cool. Love it. That's really cool. And that mimics how it would work anyways. If you had two copies of a game at home <sighs> and they were discs, you could put both of those discs in other systems. Like, yeah, it would work. It would make sense. What do we got next? Uh, I don't know. Do you want to pick shot one? at piracy? What is this? Plex has requested that GitHub take down the Plex reshare repository, allegedly because it would contribute to Plex's piracy problem. Despite the facts, fact that Plex reshare doesn't host any IP infringing material, GitHub has honored this request and replaced the repository with a DMCA takedown reference. It's unclear why GitHub made this decision, probably because they don't want to deal with it. Um, Though it, it took around three weeks for GitHub to respond, leading to speculation that they were discussing the matter with the Plex reshare developer and allowing them to respond. Plex reshare is primarily intended to allow Plex users to make shared directories browsable on the web. 
which allows people to reshare them without being the original owner. The mm. project remains available on via Docker Hub. Discussion question, is this likely to reduce piracy? Should we be concerned about companies removing non-infringing tools just because they might enable piracy? This is a super weird one. The fact that this does not actually host or even directly enable the sharing of any infringing material. There, there's, there's multiple layers to the bizarreness of this. Um, I'm extremely, I'm extremely confused that A, Plex requested this, because as far as I can tell, the only, in, the only pressure on them would be political, and I am B, extremely confused that GitHub, which hosts all kinds of tools to enable all kinds of piracy, yeah. I'm extremely confused that they pulled it down. Yeah. Should we be concerned about companies removing non-infringing tools just because they might enable piracy? I think I think that's the like this developer it sounds like they were using Docker Hub and GitHub and it I mean that's probably just going to be the route, right? If you're if you're pushing something up, don't don't have it only in one spot. <sighs> that is frustrating though. All right. Any th any other topics we want to hit? Um yeah, let's do this one really quick. UK criminalizes non-consensual deepfakes. The United Kingdom has passed a new law criminalizing sexually explicit deepfakes without consent. Creating these deepfakes carries a penalty of a criminal record and a fine. Distribution, however, could result in a prison sentence. The US Senate is also apparently considering a bill that will allow victims of sexually explicit deepfakes made without their consent to sue the creators. Um, discussion question, is it better to deal with these matters using the criminal justice system? Why aren't lawsuits enough? Another discussion question, is AI and the increased accessibility of deepfakes forcing the legal system to catch up with this as a problem? Yes, it definitely is. Um, one thing I find interesting is that it's just sexually explicit ones. I'm kind of surprised just all non-consensual deepfakes aren't a problem, to be honest. Oh, I mean, uh, it seems like... It seems like it would almost be too broad. So if I... That person looks like me, I'm going to sue this person for it. Yeah, I think it'd be really tough to enforce and it'd be tough to prove. Whereas I think it's harder to find a motive for an explicit deep fake. Um, whether that... Yeah, okay, yeah, I'm not going to get into the motives. Because like, I know there, there's, that, there's a huge issue right now of people being very angry about... Um, like, I don't really care personally, but some people care a lot of when whenever any deep fake is made of them especially people who um their their kind of job relies around it right so like we we we've seen voice actors like this recently um where even if you're not doing it for commercial means they don't want you deep faking their voice ever for any reason yep um and i'm sure there's people that are more on the visual side of things i'm just assuming i don't know models you might not be making sexually explicit images of them but if you deepfake them at all, their their job is modeling, right? You're removing their job. I don't know how okay with that they are when you're removing their job by recreating them specifically. Um, it's weird. It's a touchy point. We're headed into such uncharted waters. Yeah. All right. Do we want to head into uh, yeah, speaking Wancho of uncharted after dark? waters? Yeah. Uh, sorry, did you pick one? Uh, no, I had to push the button. Oh, f all right. Thanks, Dan. I love one show after dark. It's great. Yeah. I'll go through potentials. We ready? Yeah, I'm ready. You guys ready? Hit me, Dan. Sure. Hey, guys, thank you for all the work, and thank you for making my Saturday morning educational, but also entertaining. Heck yeah. I was wondering, what is Beyond Labs? You consider going into online education? Like, what is After Labs? Oh. Um, I feel like... <laughs> Right now, we it's need to more get labs. to labs. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's let get us focus to, on that for a bit. Let's get to labs. I mean, I think it's. Uh, I think that the opportunities for 
product testing and better information about electronics are are many um but that's for sort of the business people to decide right now we're just figuring out how to get that data in a in a scalable manageable cost effective way and that's it's a tough problem it's something that very few organizations have solved and it's something that i believe that we can solve but it's just going to take us some more time How is the smart home going? Light switches and heating. Do you recommend Zigbee or Wi-Fi? I purchased Wi-Fi devices based on features, but now I'm having network issues due to the number of devices. Oh man, I mean, it's all. <laughs> uh, okay, so the switches, I am hoping that Inavelli is going to have some of their, uh, their upcoming switches that use millimeter wave for presence detection. I am hoping that I will have some of those in hand at some point so I can test them. And then if it goes well, I would really like to use those because motion is just not good enough. Um, I'm still having problems with my blinds. Um, my HVAC has been a lot better ever since I figured out that I had too much Wi-Fi. I turned off the antennas on some of my access points, the 2.4 gigahertz antennas. Uh, they're just, they were too powerful. They were too close together. And even though I was parking my Ecobees on particular access points, um, and it's, it's partially my fault for having all the antennas enabled, but partially Ubiquiti's fault for having them all on channel one. I had them all on auto and they were all on channel one. Anyway, the point is I'm no longer having connectivity issues with those and I'm pretty happy with the HVAC, but there's still a lot to be done when it comes to lights and uh, window coverings. <laughs> and I'll, honestly, a lot of it just comes down to that I don't have the time or attention span to focus on that when I've got just a lot of other stuff going on. It's like, okay, it's the afternoon on one of the two days a week that I get to do anything other than go to work and eat and sleep. Um, do I go to the swimming pool with my kids or do I play with my light switches? I don't know. It seems like a pretty obvious one most days of the yeah. week because I do have things that I legitimately enjoy. Like I'm finally working on painting my bike. Did I show you my test pieces? Yes. Yeah. So I've got a new color that, um, if I'm a bad boy, I'll try tonight. And if I'm a good boy, I will wait until tomorrow to try, but it's a, it's a candy, it's a, a candy paint what's which, the over under on that oh i mean it depends how late the show goes um 40 to 15 <laughs> i don't know are we playing super checks tonight probably not you no, don't have time yeah, tonight i don't no. think okay that's fine uh i, think I don't I know would be murdered <laughs> I'll, I'll probably i'll probably prime it tonight <laughs> i'll probably prime it tonight and that's then a I, solid middle ground then i can sand in the morning and then i yeah. can apply paint right away instead of waiting around to sand the the, the primer for it to get hard enough to sand Seems so like a good idea. yeah it's it's a candy though so what that means is that your primer coat has to be really even and your application of the color has to be super even as well because the paint is clear so if you have a buildup somewhere it not only is going to affect the surface finish it will affect the uh, perception of the color but it's a super cool like kind of shimmery pink and um, that's what I, that's what i'm planning to do for my motorbike so that's the reason um i i did shave the beard for the super shallow cheap butt reason of that i was getting that facial treatment that cost the same whether they did my whole face or whether they just did above the the lips uh but i'm keeping the face clean until i am finished with my painting project because let me tell you i uh painted for a lot of years i've inhaled a lot of paint you know it, yeah masks they're not perfect um and i was like okay i know this automotive paint is like way worse um, but all I'm doing is I have like this one thing and I'm just going to go like this and I'm right next to the exhaust fan. So I'm just going to go like that one time. And as soon as I did it and accidentally pulled in just the tiniest bit of air, I was like, Hmm, poison. So, uh, let yeah, me go. There's a reason why none of the firefighters have beards. Yeah. Let me go get my, let me go get my organic uh yeah. you know filtered nonsense and and everything and even if i'm doing one pass of the sprayer i will be putting that on every time uh so that's that's good to know yeah um jack says uh why am i on twitch why am i looking at twitch chat well it says it starts with automotive paint ends with super glue a paper bag in a back alley yeah um i believe you though 
that that's uh, you know uncommon uncommon twitch w good take witness me paint this bicycle <laughs> <laughs> thank you dan you're welcome don't forget eye protection or or uh tynan will get angry at you uh yeah. yes i don't have bespoke eye protection but i'm wearing swim goggles that seal so if that should probably be good enough perfect yeah Okay, let's see what's up next. I've even got the full bunny suit, actually, but I don't put that on every time, mm -hmm. which uh -oh. I think is why I have um, these marks on these pants, because I'm pretty sure these are new. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, it sucks, because yeah. we I don't just have an unlimited supply of the LTT cargo pants. All of mine are prototypes still. We don't have our mass production yet. The Howdy LDL, pronounced ladle, ladle, ladle. Howdy ladle. Linus, what's the biggest compromise you or Yvonne have had to make with each other when implementing new tech into your house? I mean, that's a better question for Yvonne than me. Uh, she's had to make all kinds of compromises, like her lights staying on. <laughs> and Linus like, had to has to make few. I don't know how she hasn't murdered you for that. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of a miracle. Um, she's a very wonderful woman, and I will never get divorced, at least voluntarily. Yep. Moving on. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Wan Crew. Is the labs hoodie the same as the dropout hoodie? I recently got the dropout and hoodie. I uh, love it. It is not. Yeah, I didn't think so, but I didn't want to say. No, for it's sure. our it's our standard hoodie. The dropout hoodie is a sick upgraded hoodie, and if you manage to get your hands on one of those uh, while we had it on promo, you are very smart. And if you buy one now, you're also very smart. It's a really nice hoodie. It's it's probably mm, not fa. Uh, I don't know. It's hard to pick favorites. It's like kids, right? Like I don't have a favorite, but it's a really great hoodie, and I wear mine all You'd the time. You'd probably be upset a little less if this one. You know, <laughs> more, you I more. Oh well, okay. And the point is, uh, yes. Um, <clears throat> what's next? <laughs> hey, LLD. I love listening to you guys talk about product development. What is something that is significantly more complicated than you thought prior to LTT store or float plane? Uh, I was reading a different message. What file downloads? I did not realize how critical it is that video loads in chunks until we tried to overcome the IT challenges around just allowing people to download the file continuously. Um, especially when a new video drops, we would have this challenge where the more people are hitting it, the more oh. longer it takes for them to download that continuous file and the more detrimental it is to quality of service. Whereas when you can feed everyone in chunks, you can balance all your different users and you can accommodate many more users much more easily. Obviously, I, I was aware of chunk loading and I was aware that people obviously do it for a reason, but I had never really sat down and had a thunk about it until we were up against the challenge. And the reason we were was because we offered streaming, yes, but float Someone plane. Someone thought it was a great idea. Okay. To support downloads. I thought it was a cool idea. Just like how someone thought it was a great idea to support live streams. The idea was that people could, whether it's, you know, for their own archive on Plex or whatever else, uh -huh. keep a, a local copy of the content as part of a perk of having a float plan subscription, DRM free, blah, blah, et cetera, et cetera. The, the, look, the point is that, yes, it's much more challenging than I personally thought it would be. It's not actually like hard to do. It's just, uh, yeah. Cause like if, if first of all, most people don't watch 100% of every single video they try to watch through like a, a VOD streaming scenario. But if they're downloading it, now they're downloading the entire thing for sure every time, right? So, uh, okay. So it's guaranteed to take more bandwidth on average 
for the people downloading it than the people not downloading it, uh, for the people streaming it. Uh, and then you also have the issue that if a video, uh, say the WAN show, say someone has a script the WAN show. that automatically, <laughs> someone has a script that automatically uh, downloads do every single VOD that shows up on Floatplane. Yeah. That's going to include VODs of the WAN show. So now they're downloading like four hour long videos, but they don't want the download to take four hours. Mm. If you're streaming it, you can deliver it to them over the course of the four hours, which they probably won't watch the entire thing of, so you're saving bandwidth anyways. But no, they want it fast. So, yeah, downloads are... I don't know. It's a... It's whatever. LTT Store Whale here. I own multiples of almost all your merch and love the quality. The one thing the rest of my family loves is the onesie. When will we get a new design? Probably never. It hasn't been a big mover for us, and uh, I don't think we can support the various sizes in a completely different design. Adding skew, our skew count has ballooned, and we need to pare it down. It's unfortunate because that's like I've I've heard this feedback before, and it's like I don't know. Emma wears the onesie like all the time. Yeah, the the challenge for us is that a lot of the time. Um, we still, in spite of our incredible reach in the tech sphere, we still struggle with marketing. Yeah, we have really good quality products, it's and hard to the, get out. the feedback, like go on the go on the bloody site and read reviews. The feedback on the products is great. Anytime I see someone talking about how overpriced our products are, I'm like, well, you're a f-ing idiot because you clearly either don't understand or appreciate quality. Uh, or you do and you've just decided to declare it at being something and you've never even tried it. They're good products. And occasionally, even a good product can have a lemon, like well, you know, a seam will rip once in a while, but that's what the Trust Me Bro guarantee is for. Um, so we've got a good product. We just, I don't know, man. We, uh, we struggle to move volume of it. I think part of it is just the focus of our product development. There's been a lot of Linus-led development when it comes to the... Um, the direction for our physical goods. It's just like, you know, stuff that I like, stuff that I think is good, stuff I think is is comfortable. Um, and we, yeah, I mean, Crystal says, I got the logo notebook today. It's so nice. Yeah, it's great. We sell like two a day or one a day or something. Like it's not, it's not, it's not meaningful. Um, so something like that may very well get discontinued uh, unless we can kind of figure out how to market things better. And until we figure out how to direct our product development a little bit better, it's going to be hard for us to um, craft messaging around it. And so it's it's kind of a chicken and egg thing. So we're going to have to have some stuff fail in order for us to succeed better at our core competencies. Yeah, this is the onesie. Yeah. 89% of the reviews are five stars. There's no two star, no one star, but there's only 38 reviews. Yeah, dude, we don't fuck around, but like, guys, we could use some word of mouth, you know? Yeah. Like, cause it's, it's great. Yeah. I don't pers- I, I don't personally like onesies, but like, I, I know a bunch of people that do. Emma loves them, she wears it all the time. It's like one of her favorite garments. Maybe so. if it wasn't called merch. Yeah. I don't know. I, it could be. Yeah, it could be a perception thing. I think a lot of people assume that our merch is 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 merch. It's just some piece of crap with a logo silk screened on it or whatever. But like even our printer, you know, for all the, for, yep. I mean, you guys have heard me talk about our printer and our frustration with you know the scale that he operates at and and all that kind of stuff. But are we using someone else? Yeah. No. Why? Because he because he fucking cares, right? Like he 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 cares about his craft. He does a great job and that's something that we respect more than you know an additional printing capacity, right? So I don't know, man. We can't uh can't win at everything. There it is. Hey DLL, have you had the chance to watch the Fallout show yet? If so, what do you think? I was rather certain he hasn't. I haven't. I don't really watch shows. I was wondering if you have. No, all I know that it's canon. The whole thing is canon. Oh, that's unfortunate. Hmm. But I kind of hate that. But it's a bit of a meme because Fallout New Vegas had three endings and Todd Howard said that they were all canon. Did he? Mm. Okay. I thought Something. Fallout New Vegas specifically wasn't canon. It, it's, it's basically this thing. I don't know. I haven't seen it. I'm not sure what the public perception is. No, Fallout New Vegas is not canon. 
Wait, never mind. I read this wrong. No, the Fallout show didn't make New Vegas non-canon. And then when Todd Howard was asked, my understanding is that he said, uh, yeah, it's canon. Uh, Howard told IGN, there might be a little bit of confusion in some places, <laughs> but everything that happened in the previous games, including New Vegas, happened. So which ending happened? Huh, Todd? And, no, huh? All not of even, them. Huh? Not all even of just them. Endings. It's a multiverse. They're going multiverse. No. No. That makes sense. Follow multiverse. Yeah. Let's go. When the atomic bomb blew up, it created parallel realities. Wow. People really want you to watch this show, Luke. It's also all a simulation. They want you to watch it. Good luck with that. I don't really watch shows. What is it even on? I don't know. No, I don't have it. Plex. Wink. <laughs> <laughs> Luke, your front-end refactor to React oh, is man. impressive. What's the motivation, and how long did it take? Guys, um, <laughs> you're not going to convince him telling him it's on Prime. That's going to make it worse. That is actually the least convincing platform. Yep. Don't have it. Tell you that much. Um, yeah, he's not going to give Amazon a dollar. Nope. Um, <laughs> but I might check out someone's ISOs. Um, the, the React... The re <laughs> Uh, the React conversion thing. Um, Use Linus's account. <laughs> do have one. We, we needed to do something. Um, we needed to either majorly clean up what we had on Angular uh, or refactor to React. It, it was honestly going to be probably a fairly similar amount of work to do one or the other. And at the point in time where we made the decision, I think React made complete sense. I think if we were making the decision now, it might have been less painful to stick with Angular. Angular had a massive update recently, which looked really good. Um, but we're very happy with React. The team, uh, Jaden especially, I think is like super, super stoked about the migration that's happening, or at least where it is now. It was a little painful along the way, but he's happy with where it is now. People are happy with with the fact that we're going to be on React. Um, React is is a heavy component of the Labs website as well. So something that's all warm and fuzzy for me is that my teams are working on similar platforms, which is very cool. I like that a lot. Um, so I think the end result is better than if we stayed on Angular, even knowing that Angular did get the update um, because I like the cohesion of, of, you know, across the teams working on similar things. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm very happy about the React refactor. Codebase is in a much better space now. Um, a lot easier to work with. Uh, yeah, it's just just better overall. Jane's done a great job, um, and I I also like the sidebar thing that were the the platforms that we have Flowplane um, and the Labs website. They're like independent platforms that we have. I, I can't I can't really count the store because Shopify runs the vast majority of it. Um, but the, the independent platforms that we have are becoming more and more similar over time in regards to how they're built, how their bones are set up, so that if you were a developer that worked here, you could potentially swim between the teams and it would be less painful, which is cool. But yeah. Got another one for us, Dan? I do. Hi, WAN.DLL. I bought the Chevy Volt based on Linus's review and it's the best car out there. Love it. Any major... Uh, repairs or tweaks that you had to do for the car, and what should I do to keep it in good shape? Nope. Uh, some some jackass uh, sideswiped me in the suicide lane and knocked my mirror off. That's about the only issue I ever had with it. Volt. Oh. Yeah, that was ages ago. I thought you were talking about your current car. I was like, how many billions of dollars is that going to be? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, man. I curbed it. Oh, no. Yeah. My winter wheels. It's not that bad. But I'm really upset. That's unfortunate. Yeah. It's always the first ones. Yeah, well, no, Yvonne curbed it once already on the summers, but oh. uh, she, that one was bad enough that I had it fixed. Uh, Jake knows a guy. Jake knows a guy of for course, everything. Yeah. Of course, yeah. Of course, Jake knows a guy. <laughs> My guy's now Jake. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, so Jake, Jake knows a guy. Uh, so I had that one I had that one touched up. Uh, don't, don't forget, I, I spilled muriatic acid in the back of it, though. Oh, so yeah. like that, yeah. the first scratch was a... Was a <laughs> I forgot you did that. Doozy. <laughs> she was a doozy. That is impressive. Fortunately, the floor mat covers it. Like, you actually cannot tell yeah, yeah, yeah. if the floor mat's in, so whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah, driven on Sundays, uh, battery acid all over the yeah, back. Seat. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Linus, I remember from a previous WAN show, you said you used to be an avid hockey fan. Ever 
Ever considered uh, AHL games? My local team recently played Abbotsford, and it was a great time. I have heard it's a blast. I have never gone. I've also heard that um, there used to be a roller hockey team in Vancouver. I heard those games were a blast as well. I I I bought into the hype. Of the roller hockey? No, of, of NHL. Oh, NHL. Yeah. yeah. Like I just, I was like, I don't know, NHL and the convenience it's on TV. I very rarely would go to, uh, to an, to uh, an in-person game, but I, I watched on TV. I would just, I'd put on team 1040 back in the day, AM radio and yeah, listen yeah. to the, to the talk show, talk show hosts and stuff. Like yeah. I was, I was into it, but I didn't like physically attend anything. It's the convenience of following professional sports, right? Yeah. I, I went to a game with my dad at the Langley event center. Um, and it was really fun to be honest. It was, it was interesting. Cause like I was, I was talking to my dad. Uh, I, th- I think we saw who was it? I think it was, I know we've gone to go see the bandits there, which is the basketball team, but it, we were, it was the Vancouver giants versus someone. I don't remember who. Um, and it was really fun. And y- you get that. Like I've, I've watched some NHL games where you can tell they're like, you know, holding a lot in reserve. This isn't the playoffs. Let's not get injured, whatever. These guys were going hard the whole time. It wasn't a playoff game at all, and they were just, like, uh, every right. play, they were just sending it. Every play, you are potentially getting, potentially scouted. getting scouted. Yeah, so they, it was it was very high energy the whole time, regardless of what the score was. It was very fun to watch. Um, I had a good time. I don't even remember who won. It was just, like, entertaining the whole time through. So, yeah. And right. the tickets were cheap and, and it the can arena's be, closer. It can be more interesting when um, everyone's good, but not so good that they don't make mistakes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, like, what's more exciting? Uh, a, a clean, tight defense or a big giveaway in at center ice? And, like, it, it, they're, they're so much better than me that I would look like a clown. So like, which we know for sure because we've tried it. <laughs> yeah, I can't skate. Um, <laughs> nerd sports, it's fun to watch. Um, but so like, the skill gap is there that you're still watching people that are just like incredibly good at this thing. Yep. So like, that's that's established. But then they're not necessarily quite NHL level. Maybe some of the players are, and they'll get scouted up or whatever. But yep. it's it was uh, it was very fun to watch. Why still no ATX twelve VO? I really want to see it take off, and while the BTF format seemed like the perfect opportunity to do it, they're all still using the legacy specification. Intercompatibility, man. Uh, it's gonna be. It's gonna. It's gonna take off in pre-builds, and then and servers. It's happening already there. Um, in fact, I'd, I'd be surprised if they don't go even higher than 12 volt in servers. Uh, they're going to want that efficiency. And then over time, eventually, maybe we'll get it on the desktop, but it doesn't look like it has any momentum right now. Okay. Line, Lukey, and Dano, what's your thoughts on automatically changing twitter.com to x.com? How did shenanigans like Netflix? Twitter.com get past quality assurance. Well, I don't think they have much in the way of QA right now. Like it's pretty obvious that it's Didn't they uh, fire them all. Yeah, yeah. It just it just seems to be a, a zoo over there right now. Um, you you know up. about this, right? No. Oh yeah. So any reference to Twitter.com in a tweet, they were just automatically changing to uh, X.com, so people could have S E. T W I T T E R dot com, and it would go to that website, but it would change the appearance to sex dot com. Oh! So any URL that ended with an X, so that's why they were saying Netflix dot com, <laughs> that would show as Netflix dot com in the tweet, but if you clicked it. It would go to netflitwitter.com. So, like, phishing was a huge concern. I think that mostly people who um, were smart raised this as an issue, and it mostly, probably these domains didn't fall into the hands of too many fishers, but probably sure some, some people, did. some people got screwed over by it. Yeah. They just, they just do stuff over there these days. I don't, I don't, Act fast. Yeah, break stuff and break a lot of stuff. Good job, yeah. guys. Yeah. 
What is the worst piece of tech that was adopted en masse? Early smartwatches without even a day of battery life seemed like a terrible mass landfill product. I mean... That's a pretty good example. Um... Adopted en masse. Oh, PDAs. I'd say PDAs gained enough mainstream acceptance. Um, and then the, the life cycles for those were so short, like Palm Pilots and stuff. People used them for a couple of, wait, couple of years, essentially threw them away because they were getting so much better so fast. And the early ones were terrible. A couple of years is not bad. For a tech device, getting a couple of years? I guess, but I mean, it's a pretty substantial amount of e-waste. I mean, yeah, but so it was like, Oh, that's fair. Tech. That's my answer. <laughs> it's all, all of eventually it. e-waste. Uh, just potentials left. Feel free to curate or we can just go through them. Humans are dust to dust. E-waste is sand to garbage. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that just makes me sad. <laughs> Humans return to the earth. And tech just goes, goes to, to the pile. It's more, more depressing. <laughs> yeah. From earth to pile. Earth to pile, <laughs> sand to garbage. We gather here today to <laughs> look at the Apple Lisa. Oh. oh. Whatever. Poor Lisa. TSA took my black shaft screwdriver, so I guess I have to buy a stubby. Line, as you mentioned, not doing another onesie. For another low volume products, or for other low volume products, would you consider doing similar to Mass Drop? Um... I don't know, we could, but I, I realistically don't think... I think you guys would be surprised at how many onesies you have to order yeah. <laughs> in order to do a run of them. It's like yeah. hundreds and hundreds. Like, I just don't think we'd... Uh, I don't think we'd see the demand. I mean, we do it with printed t-shirts, but we also have to have a reasonable... Uh, turnaround times for these things like people get antsy when we say hey yeah this is a print to order and it's not going to ship for a few weeks there's people messaging us after a week and a half going like where the fuck my order right like it's, it's like, uh well it's exactly where we told you it was going to be it's uh, not created yet um and if and with the way that delays can occur with the way that quality issues can crop up at the last minute i just i, I don't need that headache in my life i don't need the money that badly I guess is what I'm trying to say is like, yeah, I could say, okay, yeah, we'll do a onesie and a new pattern and it'll be great. But then if we get it in and the quality sucks, like now what? I, I don't, I don't feel like I, I, I don't want the headache is basically what it comes down to. Sup Duke Dynas Lan and Lan Linus. Do you know, uh, do you ride your bike with your LTD backpack on? If so, how well does it do after a slide? Uh, we this, know. There's a couple people who have posted backpacks post-accident on the subreddit. Uh, personally, I haven't wiped out with it on. Uh, I wouldn't say that it's a good idea. It's no. not Kevlar reinforced. It's not armored or anything. Um, so you should definitely have proper gear aside from your bag. But um, I do ride a motorcycle and I it you know it is something that I considered whether it would be comfortable with riding gear on and stuff and I like it some other people like it but it's not uh it's not a promoted use case for the uh for the product hey LDL you can fight over who is the first L thanks for all the entertainment over the years what brand of optical DP cable are you running for your racked PCs for the game room it's me Infinite Cables. Yeah. Shout out Infinite Cables. Uh, I don't hey, think Luke even registered that. <laughs> Luke uh, is... No, I'm reading stuff. Nice. Luke is gone. So I got dibs. Yeah. Nice. Oh, on the first L? Yeah. Whatever, that's fine. You already took the name of all I'm, the companies. I'm the King L. <laughs> <laughs> I bought the company for a dollar. That means my name's on it. I'm the biggest L. <laughs> hey. I, I, I do... Oh, I do... I do often regret going with that we tried i know you and ed really did try yeah yvonne tried to talk me out of it too yvonne tech tips you know you know what the example i cited was for why i just thought it didn't matter you could just call the company whatever it could just be my name it's who cares like people will just not think about it that way do you know what it was no rogers sugar <laughs> I was like, nobody <laughs> thinks about that probably someone named Roger or something Rogers invented the sugar company. It's just Rogers Sugar. Who gives a fuck? And I was like, just whatever, Linus Media Group. It's not even the public-facing thing. The channel's already Linus Tech Tips anyway. What difference does it make? 
Turns out a lot. Yeah. Anyway. Nice. Hey, tall, short, and in between. If you could collaborate with any creator, brand, or celebrity on LTT store, who would it be and what would you make? Um, I mean, I wouldn't presume to tell any creator what they should or shouldn't make. Yeah. I, I would want to know their ideas. I mean, who would have thought Ludwig would be passionate enough to make a bidet? I wouldn't oh. have seen that one coming in a hundred years. The reviews, by the way, on the store are great. I so, mean, he was really into bidets before he sold bidets. Uh, I guess I guess we have these listed under other. That makes sense. But yeah, like check this out. Space of one, four stars. Swipe plus. How about a casual eighty-eight percent five-star reviews here? Let's nice. go. Awesome. Yeah, bidets are cool. Or warm. You scrub down your whole body with soap and water and all this other kind of stuff. Do not use a bidet for that. And then you, and then you have your, <laughs> then you have your poopy butthole. And you're like, nope, paper's good enough. I will put this. Dry I will put this paper that is designed to disintegrate. Yeah. Uh, let's, let's just go with that. And then it, I'm just going to kind of run around. Else. And then I'll walk around all day like that. I don't know. Bidets are good. Hi, Delinuk. What do you think about buying online movies you can't own and then pirating it or screen recording? Is it worth it to buy the movie? Sorry, what's the question? What buying you... online movies you can't own and then pirating it or screen recording is it? Oh, so like buying so, so, so form of buying the movie on like a like um I don't know. Where can you even buy movies these days? YouTube. Who cares? Yeah, YouTube. So buying the movie on YouTube and then just being like, well, f*** it. They got my money. I don't care about any of this. If my collection goes away, I will now guilt-free pirate an ISO for this and put it on my Plex server. I say that's up to you. Yeah. Personally, that would be well within my bounds of what I would consider to be acceptable because at the end of the day... It's the not by that company, to be clear. I, I believe that that's still... Yeah, makes sure. it no less illegal. But, but I don't care. But I agree. I, the rights holder got their money. Yeah, that's that's what matters. What matters to yeah. me. Um, and oh shoot, ah oh, man, I was going somewhere with this. Um, well, doesn't matter. The point it's like is the ad block thing. Yeah, the point is I I would do that completely completely guilt. Oh yeah, I know where I was going with this. In fact, if anything. I would say that if your goal is to ensure that the rights holder gets paid, that's actually a lot better than going and buying a used Blu-ray. Because that Blu-ray was already paid for and watched or whatever. Like, for me, I, I, that's obviously well within my bounds. As, yeah. as far as I'm concerned, as long as I have bought a license of that movie at some point, I'm like, eh, I'm good. Um, but yeah, if, if it's like a really great movie and you want to support it in some way, but you're just like, no, nah, man, I'm not going to log into some stupid website or put the plastic disc. What year is it? Right. Like, yeah, just buy it and then pirate it. I don't care. I'm not going to. That's not that I am the judge of any of this. And I'm not. I, I'm not a legal. This is not legal advice. But for me personally, I consider that to be okay for me personally. And that's a personal decision everyone has to make for themselves personally. Uh, Geeky Vapor says, so if I saw a movie at a theater, it's okay. Well, that's up to you. That's my whole point. It's all... Is it's always up to you're you. You're acting outside of the law effectively. Yeah. You need to draw your own moral lines. That's all I've ever said, guys. All I ever said. Whatever happened to upside down PC cases that opened on the right side panel with the motherboard upside down? Everyone needs their PC sitting on that side of the desk? I don't know. I personally run a, a reverse case. There you go. Dan has them all. I, yeah. have, I have the one that supports it now. Yeah. What is your favorite part of product development? I think I like brainstorming the most. I've always been like a, it's fun. like an idea. It's energetic. Yeah, it's it's exciting. Uh, before before you get into the real world, anything is possible. You know, like oh man, we could. What if we made a a a a a, a, a laser pointer out of failed screwdriver shafts? Did you just do that again? Did you do that thing again? I think we've talked about that before. We're making a fail pointer. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's, it's going to be made out of failed screwdriver shafts. Um, it's hilarious. Thomas had some serious reservations about the ergonomics because the, uh, the, the, the cell that I wanted on the back and I wanted it to be user replaceable and all this stuff. He's like, he's like, dude, this thing's going to look like a, like a, like an ant queen. Like it's got this giant ass on it. <laughs> Um, and I'm like, no, nah, man, it just kind of sits like right here in the hand. And then the battery is going to last for like hours and hours and hours. It's going to charge with USB-C. It's going to be like really good. It'll stuff. probably yeah. be fine. It might look weird, but once you grip it, it'll be fine. And, sure. and no, it's not going to be like a strong blinding laser. It's just going to run for a really long time. It's meant to be. Never play with your pets with a laser. It is dangerous for their eyes. But if you were to do it, this would be. A reasonably low power laser pointer that would run for like hours and hours and hours. Yeah. That's all I got. That's it. That's all I got too. That's the end of the show. Hey, guys, thank you very much for tuning in. We will see you again next week. Same bad time, same bad channel. Bye.